Hello again, everybody. Welcome to the Retro Monster Truck Review. We keep growing here. We just opened up a brand new YouTube channel where you guys can go and listen to all the archives. All the first nine episodes are uploaded there. This episode's going to be up there the second that it drops on Spotify as well. Thank you, guys. Please go like, share, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also, don't forget, follow us on Spotify if you haven't already, and please give us a five-star review on iTunes. Without further ado, it's time for Dallas 1990 with Doug Welker here on the Retro Monster Truck Review. Hey again, everybody. It's Josh Rhodes here with another edition of the Retro Monster Truck Review, an anticipated one here. This is episode 10. I've got Doug Welker with me, and we're going to be talking TNT Motorsports event, Texas Stadium in Irving, Texas, 1990, triple lane drag racing here, Doug. And man, this event is probably one of, if not the most controversial events in monster truck history. Yeah, this is, uh, I, I cannot wait to talk about this, this event. This is a it's you know it's funny that i mean this is a legendary monster truck event and when you talk about dallas texas um it i guess really it doesn't have, like cowboy stadium really doesn't have much of a history that i can think of you know with monster trucks but this one event that they held that weekend makes it infamous yeah almost. it holds it yeah. holds so much clout in the industry just because of what event took place here yeah, and I know that, you know, Monster Jam fans listening, I know that that's one of their big stops now down in uh, the new Cowboy, what, AT&T? I forget yeah. whatever the new stadium is in Irving. But um, uh-huh. the uh, I know it's a big stop for them, but Monster Jam does every big stadium anymore. So I don't, you know, it's I don't know if that's special other than Cowboy Stadium is always going to be a huge place. But yeah, this is just, um, I. it's funny in rewatching this because I rewatch it every few years. And this is one of my favorite events of all time to watch. And watching it now with the lens that we're going to discuss this, it was almost overwhelming because there is so much going on here. Yeah, there is so much to take in from this show that it is unfathomable almost. Let's start with the lineup here, though. We've got a surprise, John Pyant and Bigfoot 4. We'll get into that in just a second, though. Dennis Anderson and Gravedigger number two. Gary Porter, Carolina Crusher number two. Marvin Smith, Wild Hair number two. Steve Kane, Awesome Kong. Steve Wilkie, USA One, Scott Stevens, King Crunch, Mike Wine, Jersey Outlaw, Dave Wysorek, Nightlife Two, Bennett Clark, Clydesdale, Arlene Ed and the Fanatic, Greg Holbrook, Equalizer, Pablo Cruz, Tough Enough, Doug Spanier, Master of Disaster, John Kwasniewski, Buffalo Tremor, Jim Miller and Barbarian, Rob Morris and Four Wheel Crazy, and Kurt Fisher and Nitro Machines. That's what, 18 trucks? That's the biggest TNT lineup ever. This is such a lineup i mean this is it's an amazing lineup who are we missing here i guess john moore's not here yeah i know i know problem's not here um man it's hard to really tell who all is off of here one note that i wanted to point out is hey ushra veteran rob morris gets a shot at tnt and four wheel crazy yeah i had forgotten that he was even here again you know that yeah because he was running that ushra stuff i mean I guess, in one of the great what-ifs, and we can talk about what-ifs in a minute, but really, you're missing, as far as, like, the big heavy hitters go, really, you're missing, you know, uh, Barefoot and Taurus. I mean, that's the only thing you could really ask for, I suppose. Other than that, pretty much everybody's here. Yeah, throw in Excalibur, and then, man, you've got a heck of a lineup right here. Yep. Even without those trucks, though, this is a phenomenal lineup. But the opening of the show gets into the big drama portion of the section of the the entire season. Bigfoot Eight has been banned by TNT Motorsports. There's been a major rule t- change, according to Army Armstrong, and it only affects one team and one truck, and that's the big blue truck out of Bob Chandler's stable, Bigfoot, currently leading the points as well. This is massive. This is. You know, when we were doing this, when I suggested this, I had forgotten that this is the event that the band went into place. So that's where I was like, oh, man, we're going to have to talk about this, which is one of the biggest subjects in Monster Truck history uh, as far as like events that took place, the the actual banning of eight. Andy Brass is being interviewed right here. And, uh, of course, he's standing next to Army Armstrong. He's really only one guy to talk to at that point, personally. I think Army's the best guy to conduct this interview. 
Brass says the rule change is that the trucks now must have a leaf spring, coil spring, or coil over shock. Our truck has a nitrogen charged shock cantilever suspension, which give the truck roughly 20 to 24 inches of travel. It's been working really good and it's proven. It works so well that the guys are banning us from competition until further notice. Army comes back with us and he says, okay, let's get to that. These guys are having problems. The guys we're talking about are the competitors that are racing against you. Their point is, Andy, is that they say he came in second one year, didn't come back and race with us. We raced a whole year. These guys at Bigfoot were touring with another company. They weren't even running with us. If we'd had had a year to do what Bigfoot did, we could have built a better, better truck too. And Andy's response, the beginning of his response was like, oh, wow. Andy said, well, they could have taken a year off too, I feel. I was kind of blown away when he said that. I'm like, dude, that's, I don't think they could have. I'm sorry. I know Andy's probably angry and in heated the moment here, but that statement right there was big to me. I mean, he's angry throughout this whole thing, this, this interview. You can tell the Bigfoot guys are angry at, you know, as I don't, I don't blame them for being angry here. Uh, yeah, he's angry, and yes, they couldn't realistically, I suppose, take the time off, although we can get into the, the reasons here, and mm -hmm. then we've heard, you know, it's kind of legend at this point, why it was banned and different stories around it, but um, yeah, as far as taking the year off, I don't, uh, I, I don't, I almost don't know what to say about it. Yes, I guess the other competitors couldn't, but at the same time, I don't really understand why that's really held against anybody i mean what if somebody new came out yeah I exactly that, that didn't run before and you know one of the trucks that probably should have been banned is still running here that was yeah there's just we'll, we'll talk about that here in a minute i guess how do you want to tackle this this <laughs> massive topic well, to, fi to finish what andy was saying here is uh we didn't run with other promoters last year and we d or we did run with other promoters last year and we didn't run as much tnt as we'd like to we uh, did take some time off and designed the new truck. It wasn't a year off. It was a year of designing. The truck was put together. It was tested for three months, and we brought it, brought it out this year, and we proved that the truck will work. It does work. It's a fast truck. It's a safer truck. The truck flies better. It stops a lot easier and is a lot easier on equipment. The truck is the most technologically advanced because of that, and we're being penalized and thrown out. Can the old truck be competitive, Army asks. Well, I guess we'll figure that out tonight. And in short, Bigfoot 4 is still very competitive on this tour, but in this particular weekend, it seems like they do have some issues. Yeah, well, but they're not alone in that. A lot of trucks after this Battle Royale are going to have issues. But yes, oh, God, Big, yeah. this is one of the most brutal equipment races you're ever going to see in monster trucks. This is crazy. And yeah, they are, though. It looks like this weekend they do have a lot of gremlins, but I mean, it was clearly proven as you guys... You talked about on this podcast, you and Jason, even Louisville 90, when uh, even with the, the uh, engine problems with the fuel issues, Bigfoot 4, when that truck was driven angrily, that was, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously still competitive. It's one of the great stage two trucks of all time. And it's this probably the best stage two truck of all time. Yeah. That, I don't, that hurts coming out of a Gravedigger fan's mouth. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know how really the one could totally are you know really argue i guess with that bigfoot four just had such longevity and it was so tough and you look at its its history and everything that it's been through uh you know one thing with this when we're talking about the stage two trucks i feel like this event is the pinnacle of the stage two era personally this is where the trucks i it, i mean well we can talk about it more in the event i'm going to skip just for all the listeners out there i'm sorry i'm so excited i'm going to be skipping all over the place here but I think uh, when Andy's talking about the safety of the truck in Bigfoot 8, I think this event is a great example of why this these trucks had to evolve because this is where, you know, it's a wonder nobody really got seriously hurt here. And we're at the point yeah. to where if these trucks don't change, there's going to be fatalities or other things that, that happen because this event not is just a, I want to point out, too, not necessarily driver yeah. fatality, but around the arena kind of fatality. Sure, we'll yeah, yeah, I, I don't, while. yeah. Somebody, somebody was going to get seriously it's hurt. Really I mean, even seriously hurt. Yeah, because the the stopping ability and and when you talk about the braking ability of these trucks, you have to talk about the suspension because if the trucks are in the air bouncing, they can't stop because there's nothing physically touching the ground. And boy, do these trucks start bouncing! 
Oh, this yeah, race. they do. Uh, Chris Chapman kind of tells TNT's side of the story here as far as the Bigfoot 8 banning. And she says, I've just spoken with TNT officials, and they're in the process of deciding what to do with Bigfoot 8. TNT's goal is to keep the sport as competitive as possible, and right now, the apparent key to solving the solving this controversy is time. Time is going to take or time it's going to take for other drivers to get their new trucks ready for the circuit. At this time, TNT plans to let Bigfoot 8 return. This is just going to take a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks to build new trucks. Even as a kid, I'm like, they ain't going to have time. Nobody's going to build That's new nonsense. trucks in a couple of weeks. That that was nonsense ruling. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Again, that's, you know, this whole thing um, with TNT, it's like I feel bad in looking back because if we want to talk about the bind that TNT got in here, and for I guess if we're going to talk about blame, if you will, on this, I think ultimately you have to side it with the rule people. But I think the problem is the evolution that was going on here. If you look at other American motorsports, I don't know of anything that evolved so much quicker in like three years than if you look what was racing in like 87, 88 to what was in 1990 or even 89, if you want to talk about Bigfoot, you know, know, when Bigfoot 8 came out or even Taurus, whenever uh, the Taurus racer, that evolution is insane. And I don't know how you can really even... I uh, say legislate, I guess, put it into rules. I, TNT was in such a bind, I guess, with this, that that it clearly was not competitive because you had Bigfoot out there, even with the mechanical issues, which we'll talk about, you know, kind of kind of rocking and rolling. But um, so I guess they maybe had to do something. But at the same time, if Bigfoot was following the rules as they were written, it's just tough because the evolution was just so fast. It's just, exactly. I don't know how you could even write a rule book. Yeah, you, you couldn't really write a rule book. And Bigfoot, to be fair, was completely within the rule book at the time when they built Bigfoot 8. There was nothing in that rule book that was stating that they couldn't use a nitrogen charge suspension. They couldn't use a cantilever style suspension. They did everything that they felt was within the rules, and they came out. And legend has it, Bigfoot 8 goes out and wins 12 of its first 15 events. Yeah, and just real quick on the evolution, Josh, because you're a big NASCAR guy. Yes. When you think about stock car racing, the evolution, when they went from full-bodied vehicles to actually sort of what we're at now, you're, I mean, to go with monster trucks, how quick of an evolution would that be? You're talking about like what, from the 1960s to the 2000s almost in three years? Exactly, yes. Is, and that's it's, what monster trucks did. Or drag racing, you know, I'm a big drag racing guy. And if you want like, to look at like funny cars, you're talking from like actual production bodied and modified but production bodied and maybe even chassis you know funny cars to fiberglass rails within you know three years going from that and and of course that evolution took decades to get there monster trucks did it in three years and it's just insanity and so that's where constantly evolving motorsport and the only thing i could think of like in today's equivalent if i was going to compare this to a nascar ruling it'd be like if nascar the week before the bristol dirt race turns around and says all right guys everybody's switching to the 2022 car yeah yeah exactly i think that's a that's a good way to put it even i know it's a little bit different but it's still uh it's a little bit different but it's in today's standards it kind of fits this discussion um a couple of weeks to build new trucks. That's just a ridiculous statement on TNT's part. I, I feel confident saying that. The only new trucks we'd see by the end of the year were Micro Machines, which actually I think debuts at this event, and then Carolina Crusher 3 and Freedom Hall, which is the last TNT event. Mm-hmm. It's the yeah. only trucks that show up. Yeah, and I, I forgot, I guess through all this, that Micro Machines didn't know this was the debut of it and trying to take any other stuff. But yeah, Micro Machines is definitely here, the new uh, Breen Boys truck. There was another excuse that I'd heard over the years was that Bigfoot 8 had such a big points lead that they put it on the shelf to basically let the other trucks catch up in points. That statement's completely false because when you look at points going into this event, Bigfoot only has an 11 point lead. I know I, that. And that's what the thing I had heard, too. And it's funny, again, I've never really put uh, detailed analysis into this before we're actually going to be on a podcast and talking about it. And then you do look at it. And it's not like that's a mystery. They put it up on the screen. Yeah. They, the way it sounds like, you would think the truck had an insurmountable lead. and it. Yeah, you would it think didn't. it's got a 112-point lead at this point or something astronomical. No, it's 11 points. Exactly. That's a one-event swing that could happen and change drastically in the points. 
Uh, one thing that I'll point out here is a couple of years ago, well, actually quite a few years ago now, I got a chance to sit down with Bob Chandler for an interview with AllMonster.com when I was big into the going back and forth to doing the Monster Truck photo stuff. Mm -hmm. And I asked Bob about this. And Bob replied, and this is his quote. He says, I didn't feel it was just at the time, no. When you go back and you think about it, though, I guess overall it was a good thing. It gave everyone a chance to get caught up. Andy Brass and John Pyant went back to the series with Big Foot Four and ended up winning it anyway. So it worked out pretty well. I understand it was ahead of its time. I don't think it was very I didn't think it was very fair at first. When you think about it as a whole, the industry is as as far as the industry is concerned, it was probably a good thing. Anybody that asked, I let them measure it. I let them do what they wanted. People were getting hurt in these old trucks. We had to make some kind of change. We were going to get faster. Some tube chassis, some nitrogen gas shocks. They were the way to go. Look around now, 99% of them run that. And that was a quote from Bob Chandler in 2009. Yeah, I, and I, I read that quote. And I've, I've actually talked to Bob about this when I worked at Bigfoot, you know, mm -hmm. one of the few times. And, and some of the other guys in the shop because... A lot of the guys at the, well, in my first stint with Bigfoot in 2004 to 2007, a lot of the, the shop guys were still there, like Roy, you know, was still there. And I, at times, of course, you know, as a monster truck nerd, I'll just talk about this stuff. And there were still a lot of strong opinions about oh, yeah. it, as you I might imagine. So. I mean, like I said, this is a huge thing. This is a rule, a giant rule change in the middle of a points racing season. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, you know, done to kind of outlaw them. Again, I think Bob, though, his quote, when you look back on this, again, hindsight being what it is, I think you can see that TNT was trying to do the best that they could in an almost unwinnable situation because, as we were talking about the evolution, it everything was just evolving so fast that they they felt like they had to do something competitively, but you know maybe they didn't make the right thing. I think what makes it worse looking back, though, is obviously there was kind of some lying going on as far as you know, the points thing, like that's nonsense. And also the, we're, we're trying to wait for people to build their trucks like a couple weeks. Well, that's nonsense. I, I yeah. think, I mean, not the time, maybe, maybe the guys were talking about it, that they were going to have the new trucks out. But I think that, I don't know, they were trying to do what they could, but I think um, the real argument safety though, and we're going to get into this event because this is a demolition derby. This is a oh, straight yes, up is. demolition derby. <laughs> and I don't even know how they did an event after this almost. I, I feel like the trucks had to, everybody needed a couple weeks off at the shop to get, put these things back together. Oh, and yeah. You needed the nitrogen, well, nitrogen coilover shocks, whatever you want to talk about here, because equalizers in this race. And I'm never going to really understand how equalizer never drew the ire that Bigfoot did, because that truck is clearly a different truck than the rest of these. And yeah. The reason that it didn't, though, was because it had the coilover shocks, and that was granted in, in like, amended in in this new rule change that, hey, this is this is in. It, it was, but if I'm a competitor, I guess, if I'm a competitor at the time, Equalizer is clearly a truck that's a cut above, like, technology-wise. And I think, and again, I could be way off of this. I'm sure there are more people listening to this that know the backstory that would say, Doug, you're an idiot. You don't know. But I really think... It's just Equalizer got the pass because it was sort of the, uh, you know, his army would always talk about all oh, the boys in Tennessee sharpening their pencils. Like it's, yeah. you know, it wasn't a big team with Ford Motor Company's backing with this huge team and doing the CAD engineering. I feel like if, if Equalizer was a Bigfoot design, it would have caught hell the same way that the Bigfoot 8 did because um, Equalizer was an advanced truck. I mean, it, yes, again, it to me, even when it came out in 89, it won the points championship. So... It just looked like it was a different vehicle cut above the rest of them. And, but Bigfoot 8 is penalized. After speaking with a contact at Bigfoot, I obtained uh, something that was previously really unknown to the monster truck community as a whole, anyway. I know there were a few people out there that probably knew exactly this, but I personally didn't know 8's schedule up until the banning, and that's what I have here. Uh, a copy of the schedule that led up to Bigfoot 8's ban, meaning that we now know exactly how many events the truck ran. Uh, Memphis Mid-South Coliseum is Bigfoot 8's TV debut, where I believe it goes two out of three in the competition. Uh, the Houston Astrodome, where I think it goes one for two. Then Salt Lake City, Nassau Coliseum, and then Albuquerque, New Mexico, where it just goes straight three for three and just obliterates the field. Bigfoot 8 has a great showing in Albuquerque. And then the giant red X and the word band is shown across the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, I like how the, the graphic is like, eh. <laughs> Exactly. Um, that Albuquerque event in particular, that's cool you have that schedule. 
that Albuquerque event, uh, I watched it recently uh, in re- in response to this, you know, and yes, it was a, that was a beat down. <laughs> that, oh, was, yeah. that was, that was just a complete butt whooping. And I think that's what finally everybody raised hell. You know, in that Albuquerque event, I'm sure you're going to probably cover them at some point, but what did, because I noticed this um, in watching through, I skimmed through some of those events. I noticed Scott Stevens didn't even run against Bigfoot 8 in one of those. Was that in protest? Do you know? That I don't know. That's kind of a, one of those mysteries from back in the day as well as another part of legend. But in that race that you're talking about, I do remember it. You see foot just take off and then Stevens just kind of inches forward and just stops. But yeah, it looked like the truck. Uh, it didn't look like a transmission failure. It could have been. But that's where I was curious if that was like in protest. Because, again, you figure that was the, the last straw, though, that event when the when whoever was talking to the TNT officials and was like, all right, we this has to change right now. Yeah. One thing that uh, I kind of I did a little bit of research on this as much as I could anyway with what's out there. And I noticed that in week one of TNT competition, Bigfoot was not there. Uh Equalizer was there, however, and they ran in two uh, events in Birmingham, Alabama, which were highlights on the Charleston, West Virginia show. Gravedigger ends up winning the Charleston, West Virginia shows, I believe, back to back. But when they show the points, Digger is leading with 47 and Equalizer has 42 points, meaning that the next week when Bigfoot comes out, it's already 42 points behind Equalizer. Mm -hmm. And it takes them this long to build and regain all of those points to end up being 11 points ahead. Yeah, maybe that's more of the reason is the fact that it had such a, you know, it, it wasn't that it was so far ahead at this time, but that it gobbled up the points so quick that I suppose that was the implication was, hey, this is going to be over real quick if exactly. something doesn't change. So maybe that could be the case. Maybe it's not lying. But again, the way it's presented on television, which is what the viewer has to go off of, that does seem fishy that this, you know, it's like a one event lead in essence yeah, exactly. in points. Uh, there are really two sides to this argument. To simplify this whole thing, there are two sides here. Bigfoot use their time wisely, strategically design Bigfoot 8 with their ability to have a full staff at their disposal and countless hours of designing for a full purpose-built race truck. Bigfoot had every right to do this. There were no rules stating that this team cannot do this and take time away from a series to build this. In, in their defense, they did everything by the book. Argument number two, though, is Bigfoot's ability to have this entire staff and team at their disposal was a huge and unfair advantage to some of the other teams that are traveling up and down the road, constantly racing these trucks, getting a payday, going home to fix these trucks, and then bringing them out to the next show. Every competitor within TNT basically lived on the road, so they didn't have time to go home, sit down at a computer, and try and do what Bigfoot did. I understand their argument, but again, it's not against the rules. Yeah, I mean, again, I understand their frustration. You know, like Dennis Anderson, he's got to put food on the table. He's got to be out there, right? He's got to be running every weekend. But at the same time, I just don't know how – I mean, how do you punish – again, That if you use that definition, you shouldn't allow any new trucks because they could, in in theory, be at home designing something new. I I just – I get the frustration, but to try and legislate around that frustration seems kind of – kind of, uh, I don't know, not – fair really and and hinders hinders things but again what do i know what do i know in this case you're right though that's the argument yeah the event starts off with scott douglas doing the usual promotion of the event we see three trucks on the track racing each other for the first time this has ever happened in the sport and to my knowledge i don't believe it's ever happened again now there are probably some fairground shows that this happens at but i don't recall ever seeing this again inside of a giant stadium uh hasn't been done on a large scale since basically Uh, The clip of Master Disaster coming in an ISO shot towards the camera and then him saying three monster trucks racing side by side is sure to spell disaster is quite a bit of foreshadowing for this event right here. Yeah, um, let me just talk about my exposure to this event because now we're into the actual proper event. We're at Dallas or Irving. We're in the three wides. I remember watching this for the first time when I got home from school one day. Now, my my memory could be skewed because I forget when it aired, but I think – that uh, in in my local market, these these shows would come on like after school sometimes, because I remember getting home from school one day and watching this one way or the other. But I, I the first time I remember seeing the three trucks on the screen, I remember freaking out because I was I think six years old at the time, six or seven, and how amazing it was that that it looked. It just looked like total insanity. It was like oh wow, they always race two trucks. Well now there's three. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, yeah. 
uh, the qualifying highlights real quick here. Uh, round the first qualifying highlight we have here is four wheel crazy equalizer and outlaw four wheel crazy. The USHRA truck comes in and outruns the 1989 TNT champion here in qualifying. Problem is grenading a motor right on the first pass. Yeah, and that's it. Right. Yeah, that's it. That's all you see of four wheel crazy this entire weekend. Unfortunately for Rob Morris, who looked like he was, I mean, just by that qualifying pass, looked like he could have been out there and would have been a contender. Yeah, I'm sure he would have been too. And that, yeah, that's why I had forgotten the truck was even there in this event because it is just a one and done pass and that's it. Yeah, the next pair we had was Buffalo Tremor, Master of Disaster, and Awesome Kong. When Spanier pulls the big bastard disaster out of the trailer, he can make life miserable for anybody he races against. Good quote from Army right there. More foreshadowing as uh, Kong is the first one across the line with the top end speed, but MOD is shown here. Man, that thing comes on strong at the end. Three big, bad red trucks right here putting on a show. Yeah, this is a great pass. I mean, there are very few passes here that are not good as far as like entertainment wise. Uh, I think when you talk about the foreshadowing, there was a lot of foreshadowing in this. You could tell the post-production here that they, uh, Scott and Army, really were amping up and foreshadowing. They were having certain, fun with it. They they were. They, you could tell that they were amping up. They knew there was a lot of stuff to work with here, mm-hmm. and uh, they were really they were really doing that. And a uh, boy, Master Disaster is just hauling the mail in this event. Yeah, one thing I forgot to point out is Equalizer's famous blue and white paint scheme debuts at this event as well. Another thing to point out is another famous paint scheme, the Auto Value King Crunch. The old blue Auto Value King Crunch debuts at this event as well. Uh, and it's next up here against USA One and Micro Machines. That famous blue and yellow paint scheme, though, is one of my favorite designs, even though Scott Stevens is one of those guys that was the leading charge to try to get Bigfoot 8 banned back in the day. It's still a damn good looking truck. It does. This is... I. I, you know, it's funny because memories, memories blend together. And I, this is what I always viewed King Crunch as after, you know, the really old school, the black version of it. But yeah. this is what I always think of with like the TNT style. And it didn't even happen until 1990, <laughs> which yeah, is no, funny. Right? It, it happened this so is late what I view. in Crunch's evolution. Yep. This uh, is what I think of when I think of King Crunch in this era, though, this whole era. Speaking of evolution, though, Micro Machines also debuting at this event here. Coil over shock design, and man, when they get this truck dialed in, it's going to be something. Yeah, this truck looks, and it looks really great, too. I mean, you yes. could tell for the Breen boys, this was uh, like a pride and joy thing. It looks great. It does. It sputters off the line here a few times, kind of stalls out on the first crush car jumps, and they're going to get that fixed eventually. But that first pass, I know they, they were probably just like bringing it to this show because obviously it's not in the points. It's not going to be a points competitive truck. It's here to win, basically. So they probably threw a tune-up at it thinking it was going to work, and it, it didn't here in qualifying. Truck sputters off the line. Doesn't really go anywhere. We're left with a drag race between USA 1 and King Crunch. Crunch has an awkward bounce, sends the truck to the left between the cars, and USA 1 appears to be smoking over the final set of cars. Fisher finally gets going and does set a time. Uh, USA 1 with a 6.75 and Micro Machines at 25.82. King Crunch comes back and runs again, though, and sets a 9.59. And the reason that he comes back and runs again is because he basically disqualified himself. And under TNT rule, you can come back and run again with a three-second time penalty. Yeah, I never... That was interesting. I don't. I didn't remember that either until this show. I guess I never paid enough attention to know that. It was almost like a pulling rule where you could turn down your first pull if you're the first guy out in the class and come back, you know, mm-hmm. as an option puller. Uh, next we have Nightlife, Barbarian, and Bad News here. Nightlife... They say that Nightlife is another brand new truck pulling up here to the line. There's a lot of new iron that debuts at this event, and there's a lot of old iron that breaks down at this event. Uh, yeah. Dave gets the whole shot here. really doesn't look back, and Nightlife is smooth as silk. Yeah, I wanted to – we'll talk about Dave Weistork. I have in my notes here. I specifically want to talk about the Nightlife truck a little bit later on here, and we'll do that as he advances. we get into racing. Equalizer back onto the line here, which is a surprise, and again, under TNT rules – Equalizer was a part of the first pair that hit the crush cars. This rule I didn't even know existed until I rewatched this event here uh, recently. I completely forgot that after, if you're the first truck to hit the cars, you can come back and make another pass if you'd like. It, it disallows your first time, so if you mess up, you're kind of screwed. But he comes back, runs this track, and Equalizer sets the fastest qualifying time, 6.03. Yeah. As, again, I, I never knew about it either. It's This is totally, they ripped this off of pulling. If For you guys listening, in truck and tractor pulling, typically the first guy who makes a hook 
in the class, he does have the option to come back either at the end or several hooks down because he's the first guy out. He, you know, can read the he's track. He's the first the guy to test the dirt, basically. Yeah, the de- yep, and the test the sled setting. So he doesn't get to see anybody else run. So they let you come back. So that's really what this is, like the this, this version of it. Up next, Tough Enough, Clydesdale, and Fanatic here. Arlene Ed, the only female driver in the field. And, man, I got to tell you, Arlene does a really good job this weekend. She does. She ran very, very well. I don't really remember anything about the truck, but given all the the lineup here, she was fantastic. That bright orange truck, though, just kind of leaves a blank expression on me. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. (laughs) That's a Trigger King joke, just so everybody knows. (laughs) Clydesdale has the better pass here in the left lane. It's, that's uh, a really good time. Fanatic comes along in the middle lane to run well in second in the pair. Uh, very competitive times here for both Clydesdale and Fanatic. 6.72 for Clydesdale, 6.92 for Fanatic, and tough enough trailing behind 7.29. Uh, next up, though, this is a pair, and this is where some more drama happens here. Grave Digger, Carolina Crusher, and the Wild Hair. The story here is Anderson pulls to the line, and Army and Scott talk about the breakage that have plagued it all season. We get a nice long shot of Digger pulling to the line here. Some people buy tickets just to see this truck run. Boy, that is the truth <laughs> right there mm-hmm. as far as a grave digger goes. Dennis leaves the line hard and then just immediately locks up. All four tires just completely stop right there for the digger. Uh, the word that we got later on, I don't believe it's mentioned in the broadcast, but it sounds like the transfer case actually locks up in the grave digger. Yeah, I, I saw in the notes here too how you talked about how that there looks like there was a delay in getting the truck off because if it was yes. all locked up like that, I'm sure that was a nightmare. Oh, yeah. The digger weighs 14,000 pounds at this point, and they've got one loader out there trying to move it with locked up tires. That thing's not going to move easy. So what they end up doing here is they just move the truck to the right side of the track and kind of get it out of the way of the lane. And then Digger basically, after the event's over with, they come out, they they get it freed up, and they take it to the back. Yeah, it's kind of a logistical thing there. Not enough equipment really to get it out. And there was a traffic jam the whole time here. You can see when they would line up the three on one side to try and get the next the pair out there. It looks like uh, logistically this was a tough event to try and keep them rolling. Yes, it was. Uh, and I think what was really a contributing factor to this was how far out they were pitting. They were mm-hmm. pitting, uh, what is, I want to say, what say, uh, What did they say? 100 or so yards or something like that? Out, or 600 some odd yards. Yeah, out outside. back. Mm-hmm. Then they would drive through the tunnel, come out, and park at the line. And if anybody had any problems, they're still sitting there running at the line. I mean, motors are getting hot. Brakes are getting hot. It's not, a, not a good thing, not a good combination to have pits that far out, at least at this time. Yeah, and you had the, um, of course, a long track too, a super long track, high speed where you're turning a high RPM. So heat, heat was a big factor. I know for everybody all night. Yep, definitely was here. Bigfoot's the last to qualify here, and uh, and kind of a unique shot. We see Go Go the gorilla kind of waving at John Pine as he makes yeah. his pass. Bigfoot gets into the field with a six point three three, and then we get the top six in qualifying shown. Equalizer with that six point oh three. Carolina Crusher six point oh nine. Awesome Kong, 6.16. Master Disaster, 6.23. Bigfoot, 6.33. And then we get Buffalo Tremor rounding out the top six with a 6.59. Doug, this is a very difficult bracket to explain. (laughs) Oh, man. And we ran this in our Trigger King RC Club. We did a three-wide last summer. It was a pain to set up the bracket. Now, after watching this again, when we do it again this summer, I've got a little bit better idea. But, boy, yeah, this is basically just... Fast losers, fast losers, fast losers keep coming back until so you really get, fast losers. <laughs> it's really until you get to what? What is it? The semis when you finally start doing the real win and go home? Because normally they just keep taking the top two over and over. Yeah, that's what they do here. Uh, first pair, equalizer, top qualifier versus nightlife and wild hair. Wild hair stalls in the starting line, making it a two truck race here. But nightlife, amazing hole shot from Dave Wysoric here. He holds on and actually defeats equalizer. But at the same time, I imagine Holbrook was kind of holding back just a little bit because he knows he's going to come back in the next round no matter what. Yeah, that's uh, the strategy of this. And there definitely had to have been strategy you could see employed by some of these guys where some of these pairs, they probably knew they weren't going to have to run full open, you know, to, to be the top, one of the top two. And especially as this would go on to be really a battle of attrition because this track was just brutal on the trucks. We already talked about the heat in the engines. That's not even talking about the ramps and the air and the speed. And oh, yeah. so, this, yeah. This this weekend tests a lot of equipment here. 
Uh, Master of Disaster comes out next to take on Outlaw and Barbarian. Barbarian, non-factor here. The truck simply doesn't move off the line. However, Master of Disaster in wild fashion with the front tires lifting up off the ground and a wheelie start. We see this the entire weekend mm -hmm. out of Doug Spanier. Outlaw ready to, is already trying to play catch up as MOD puts the power down. Master Disaster bounces hard in no man's land, but still gets about a truck length victory over Outlaw. Both trucks hard on the brakes. And um, MOD, Master Disaster, actually lifts the rear tires up off the ground after the finish line. It just starts the it starts the trend of just not having enough room to get these things shut down. Shutdown area is insane here. I mean, this is the, I don't, maybe in Penda when you would see some of the trucks in those real high speed events go crazy after they would finish and you see a lot of rolls or trucks swapping lanes. I don't remember an old school race ever where the trucks had this much issue in the shutdown area. Yeah, I agree. Army calls the shutdown area spooky, and he is not wrong at all. That is the one spooky little area to, to completely shut down a truck at. I mean, they've had to shut them down in tighter areas than this, but I think what was really happening here was, like, what we were saying. They're pitting so far out. They're getting a lot of heat in the brakes just coming into the building. They're getting a lot of heat in the motors just coming into the building. Brake fade is a thing, and I think that happened to a lot of trucks here at this event. It, it's just a, a real brutal combination of the, yes, the brake fade from the heat and trucks being in the air and those tires not even being able to be on the ground. And sometimes when they were, you'd only have two or one tire at the moment. Yeah, Army and, says uh, at some point, uh, either in this broadcast or the next one, he talks about when you're four feet in the air, the brakes don't work very well. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I don't care what you have. Uh, if you got four wheel disc or internal, if you're in the air, you're not stopping. And I think also... What contributes to some of the craziness is when a lot of these trucks do come down on two wheels and guys hit the brakes, it creates like a violent, you know, the chassis keep getting upset. So then the back will hit harder or something else hits harder and it creates more bounces and more just uh, wackiness, really. Mm -hmm. And this is again, this is where you see the old school technology is really bursting at the seams this is as far as you could push these whole trucks yeah the, this event really proves this is as far as you can go with the style of technology that is under 97 percent of the trucks out there at this point yeah uh clydesdale bad news and carolina crusher is next here bad news is a no-show on the line scott and Arling, army blame that on the heat and the engine basically saying that uh they're just going to go with these two trucks carolina crusher takes the win with typical gary porter pass here smooth as silk from gary uh I mean, what else can you say about Gary Porter? The man is just as smooth as silk almost every single time this entire weekend. Yep. Every pass is good. The equipment is good. It's just, it's typical Gary Porter and Carolina Crusher. The thing I noticed here is Gary wins, and then Clydesdale does the exact same thing you see a few people do after the race. Gary goes straight into the tunnel, and Clydesdale just dives right in there after him to try to make the tunnel. Yeah, I think they're just trying to get out of Dodge as quick as they can, really. Yeah, and that's about all that they can do. Uh, the trick tonight might be going to the center lane, knowing that you can go for it and aim straight for the center door. Good call from Scott Douglas right there. Uh, Gary Porter states that due to pitting such a long way away, his truck is currently sitting at 170 degrees by the time it makes the starting line, and by the time he finishes, it's at 200 before going back to the pits. Yeah, again, this is where that heat really comes into play here. It's just, it's, it's wreaking havoc on these guys, especially the further they go, the guys who are running further in the night, because you also got to push the equipment harder. Yeah, exactly. As we go to commercial break here, we see a problem appearing to be uh, developing with the Bigfoot truck. Uh, but when we come back, we get King Crunch USA one and awesome Kong. That's a heavyweight matchup anywhere that you go back in the day. And it does not disappoint. Wilkie leaves the line hard has the lead and wins, but takes quite a bounce off to his left, sending him towards Awesome Kong. Great driving from Steve Kane here to avoid Scott, or excuse me, to avoid uh, Steve Wilkie, who comes flying straight across, right across him, basically. Yeah, and he knocks that hay bale too. Oh you yeah, can see the the force, um, even from just when he kind of kisses the hay bale. Yeah, great driving here. I don't, you know, we haven't really talked about the drivers. I think here. The fact that these guys are all skilled at this point, all the top guys, you know, they're kind of seasoned racers in the monster trucks. That really comes into play here because this could have been a lot worse, these accidents, if these guys weren't skilled and kind of know who. You can almost feel the dynamic of the guys know who to give room to and everything. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of a dance that happens at the end here. 
Wilkie is happy after this pass right here, saying that he really owed both guys after the indoor season where they'd beaten up on him. Steve Wilkie is kind of relatively new to the seat here, still in USA number one. But, man, I got to tell you, he's just as cocky as Rod Litzow. I know. They, yeah, you know, old USA one here is also really showing its age to where the truck is going straight for the most part and going fast. But, boy, it's it's having, again, it's just the technology is pushed way past its limits, I think. Fanatic comes out here and has a buy run due to Bigfoot not coming out. Bigfoot number four sitting in the pits with a Magneto issue. Truck just won't fire. Shame for the Bigfoot team after all the drama that we had at the beginning of this episode. Yeah, it was a bummer to see, you know, the Bigfoot went out. I remember watching this race even at the time, and it was a bummer that it really truck had mechanical issues this weekend. It wasn't you didn't get the full on Bigfoot four experience here. No, no, you didn't. Buffalo Tremor and Tough Enough is next. Both trucks will be advancing here. Neither take it easy on each other at all. They almost come together at the end of the track with Buffalo Tremor taking the win. Uh, Tough Enough has steam pouring out of the back of the truck here. Another indication of just how hot these trucks are getting at the end of this track. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And they again, Buffalo Tremor had a good showing here too. Well, Johnny K, he I think he ran pretty well at this event. Oh yeah, Buffalo Tremor runs. I mean, it was a very consistent track. Remind me a lot of Carolina Crusher too. Yeah. It was just a little bit behind as far as technology-wise, I would say, as far as uh, CC2 was. But, man, it was just a consistent truck. It was. I agree. It was, it, was a, it was a cool old truck. Round number two right now, Nightlife, Outlaw, and Clydesdale. Nightlife getting the surprise win over Equalizer in round number one. But, again, Equalizer is going to come back as one of those 75 fast losers that we have here at this show. A uh, photo finish between Outlaw and Nightlife. A great leave by Outlaw helps him keep up and has a really hard charging battle with Nightlife. It's really very hard to call the winner in this race. TNT gives the win to Outlaw, but I personally, if you look at it, to me, it's a dead heat. They were so close. This is a fantastic. This is like now we're in the just awesome race after awesome race, pretty much. Yeah, this this race was amazing and it was tough. It Yeah, same thing. It looked like a dead heat. I mean, I don't. I don't know how they had their timing set up for this. You would think the three lanes presented some issues with like the lasers, like getting to the center lane. I'd be curious how that even happened, like how they did that. But yeah, that's where they give the wind out law here. But, you know, Dave, Dave Wysorek, I said, I wanted to talk about them. They always will, you know, in these events, these, the old TNT events, Army and, and Scott and Richard Leak, they'll always be hyping up the trucks that really have no chance kind of, let's be honest here. Like the, you know, the no problems and the other trucks on the tour, but Nightlife really was a great running truck that yeah. could punch way above its weight. And you never really knew with Nightlife uh, whether it was going to win or, or lose. And I mean, that is a really a big compliment because he wasn't running with big sponsors or anything. And I don't think he had the biggest engine and everything else. But, man, he could drive and he was always consistent. And he would you would see him go far some nights, like really far. And it, I, I really liked Nightlife as I've watched so much TNT recently. I had forgotten how good of a truck that really was. Oh, yeah. Nightlife 2 was probably one of the most consistent trucks ever built. There, there's a lot of consistent trucks in TNT. This one and Carolina Crusher 2 are probably the, at the top of that heap as far as very consistent trucks. Yep. I would place this one just below Carolina Crusher 2, mainly because Carolina Crusher could still go out there and get some wins, while as Nightlife, I believe the only win it got, although it was prestigious, was the Houston Astrodome event. Yep. Same. He didn't really get the results, but he could be there. And it wouldn't be a total surprise, I suppose, if you saw yeah. him in the finals or yeah, close it to it. wouldn't be at all a surprise. Uh, USA won here, Fanatic and Awesome Kong. All three of these trucks leave the line pretty evenly, though. But halfway through No Man's Land, here's where the horsepower advantage of USA won kicks in. Uh, we see Kong gains a little bit of a uh, little bit of it back over the cars. But that top end speed from USA won is just really unbeatable at this point. Uh, man, USA 1 gets out of shape, though, after the line here again and dives off to the left side, and Kane has to make a huge move again <laughs> to avoid Steve Wilkie. Yep, truck's doing the dance. Great race. And uh, Fanatic really did hang in here with two heavyweights. Again, just talking about how she was a great, yeah. you know, great driver stepping in here and having to play really with some really experienced drivers here. So exactly. good job by her. Shout out to Arlene Ed. If she ever happens to listen to this, girl, you can drive. She only lost this race by three quarters of a truck. I know. To, to, and look at the truck she raced against. Two of the fastest. Yeah. And she came in, by the way, second here in the middle lane. Yeah. 
I mean, uh, Wilkie obviously is happy. He thanks his sponsors, explaining that he literally used every inch of shutdown space given to get stopped, and he's not lying at all. I think everybody was at this point. Uh, Mike Wines interviewed here, said he couldn't stop for a post-race interview earlier because he had to drive the truck straight out to the back. He said that this truck is two hours old. Yes, folks, again, another brand-new truck here. This is the debut event for uh, Jersey Outlaw 2. Uh, Wines says the truck's two hours old. They just finished it. It has no electrical fans inside of it to keep it cool, so the truck has been running at 280 degrees. He has to keep taking it outside to put water in it to keep it cool. That's hot, man. He's running it. The truck's running really hot there. And it, But you know what? It's running great. Maybe the fact running that hot, this is one of the better showings you'll see from Outlaw ever. Yep, yep, it sure is. Uh, here, though, is the big heavyweight points matchup. Carolina Crusher, Equalizer, and King Crunch. That's second, third, and fourth in points battling each other here in round number two. Uh, man, amazing how these trucks just happen to draw each other. Equalizer, though, this is the big one. Equalizer stalls on the starting line, and an opportunity to gain points on Bigfoot just goes straight to the wayside for Holbrook. Yeah, this is a tough loss, a real tough loss for Equalizer here. And uh, what is, I mean, it was probably his race because Equalizer – is a great runner. You can't really say that, I guess. Here, you can't you can't say that honestly, though, because Carolina Crusher second in nineteen eighty nine. I believe it's third in points here going into this event. Uh, no, excuse me, it's fourth in points. King Crunch is third. But man, I, you can't ever count either of those other two trucks he's racing against out. I believe the top end speed was there for Equalizer, but the consistency of these true two trucks next to him was the detriment that he had to overcome. Yeah, just a great lineup too. Those three are, that's a, just an awesome, that's an awesome lineup of race, uh, of a oh, race yeah. there. Stevens gets a little bit of a surprise win here over both of these guys. And uh, when you watch Stevens' truck land after the finish line, you just see the suspension, the truck's going back and forth. It's bouncing left and right. It's crazy, and isn't it? All over watch the, the truck. Yeah, Stevens says he's amazed it stayed straight. <laughs> Honestly, uh, I wanted to. No blank. <laughs> you know what I mean? Everything, everybody was thinking that same thing. It is, it is amazing that it did go straight because that truck was about, looked like somebody had the axles and was playing with them almost. Exactly. Toy truck. We get Greg Holbrook interviewed here. He's very disappointed. And he, uh, just like a lot of people in TNT in 1990, claims that the <laughs> radio box shut him off. Go figure. That, those dosh dang radio boxes. It's never, it's never mechanical issues. It was never their problem. It's always a dang radio box. Yeah, it's always that kill box in 1990 that shut him off. And man, never an electrical issue, anything like that. It's always that little box that TNT puts in there. Well, everything worked good until we put their box in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The best was you in the Louisville thing with uh, you and Jason talked about it with when uh, Mopar Madness yeah, the, the box, box just comes bouncing out and <laughs> yeah it just bounces on the hood, <laughs> pretty funny. <laughs> oh Lord, Pablo Cruz is shown here. We get a nice little feature on Pablo Cruz as he inter interviewed by Army. Pablo drove fifteen hundred miles to go racing in Texas this weekend. Says he'll travel anywhere to race, and uh, just to please the people. Says this is his same truck with an all new body, all fiberglass, and the truck lost about 900 pounds with just the switch from uh, the steel body to the fiberglass, which is an insane weight drop for a truck like that. Uh, he gets ready to line up though here against Buffalo Tremor and Master Disaster. And again, man, I don't know of many leaf sprung trucks that would launch into a wheel stand off a, st a standing start other than Master of Disaster. Yeah, and it's it's interesting how in other episodes always of uh, when Army, you know, they'd always, to make things to talk about, they would talk about the wheelbase constantly, right? Mm -hmm. When it really didn't matter at all. Here it matters. it And it doesn't seem like it's discussed much, which is um, interesting, I suppose, mm -hmm. just because of that. Because, yes, he is, that short wheelbase, he is launching, again, like a drag car with the wheels up in 1990. Oh, yeah. Speaking of wheels up, his his hit, I mean, he wins this race flat out, but he, according to Doug, he slips it into third gear right at the time he starts to go in the air off of that third jump. And that truck is flying. That is one of the biggest launches you're going to see this entire weekend out of a truck. And he lands in that truck. And like we said, when you're four feet in the air, you can't stop. And Master Disaster does not stop. <laughs> this truck just keeps going, slams into a hay bale. And one thing that I wanted to point out was, number one, great camera work for that guy standing at the end of the end zone with the ISO cam. Amazing camera work capturing that. Also, scary as hell to watch. 
because you see when Spanier hits the hay bale, directly next to him is the hay bale that that cameraman was standing behind. I know. Uh, and yes, one of the great shots in monster truck history is that that floor cam shot of this, of Masters' disaster, hitting basically hitting like the afterburners and then bouncing to a stop, which is crazy. But boy, as we're talking about the danger here, everybody into the track here, that it was significant danger down there. And oh, yeah, yeah, this could have been real bad. This could have been very bad. One thing to point out here, and this is just from the cameraman's perspective, he, I assume, is just going to like, you know what, I'm going to stay right here. He has absolutely no idea what's going on behind him with Buffalo Tremor, and neither do other cameras around the place because they don't capture it. Buffalo Tremor just drives straight into the wall on the left side on the other <laughs> side, completely misses a hay bale, and, drive, and plants the front two tires straight into the wall. Yeah, again, balls of steel by this cameraman here who, you know, probably just was gritting his teeth and just... Oh, yeah, I'd like to shake this guy's hand and say, man, you got some balls of steel to be able to handle that. That is a scary, scary thing to think of if one of those two trucks just had... Like, say Buffalo Trimmer gets a bounce and has to go to the right. There's only, a no, like, one one or two other hay bales off to that side. I know, and good one on Johnny got a cameraman K. behind him. <laughs> Johnny K was very... had great awareness here um, to to not let this get more dangerous than it could have been. In essence, he kind of was... He was the one who uh, braved the danger himself and his equipment by hitting that wall. Yeah, speaking of braving the danger, I don't know if Army's got a death wish or not, but it, he, he goes and stands in the middle of the tire tracks that are left on the wall. Classic, classic shot of Army here with two giant monster truck <laughs> tire tracks on either side of him. Uh, it says, they all knew they'd have to fight, have a fight on their hands, but what they didn't realize, you literally have to take it to the wall. And he ain't a kidding. I <laughs> know. Uh, again, this is just a crazy, <laughs> crazy uh, event here. Semi-finals. Uh, we get a couple of announcements here. Or excuse me, one announcement. Buffalo Tremor out due to breakage, obviously. <laughs> I mean, yes. You look at the front of the truck, the left or the right front tire is kind of hanging off the side of it when they tow it to the back. So it's it's not going to be coming back. Clydesdale gets reinserted here. So it'd be Clydesdale, Carolina Crusher, and Outlaw. Awesome Kong, King Crunch, and Nightlife. Fanatic lost but is coming back as a fast loser against Master Disaster and USA One. The winner of these three races will go to the finals. Yeah, so we're finally here now. We're at Real Elimination Racing, the final nine. Yep, and this exactly. is high drama. And Usually it's the final four. Now we've got the final nine. Yeah, and we didn't talk racing. about this. I, I wanted to, to mention it. Uh, Nintendo had the power play there from that launch, the Master Disaster thing. Yeah, uh, I loved the as, as the production value on this show was amazing. This is as, as good as it gets. And I love how Nintendo's a sponsor. They, of course, have the Micro Machine sponsorship, which is awesome, too. So even, like, you get the big corporate, you know, the big companies here that are supporting Monster Trucks. It just shows you now this is kind of the height. This is the, this is the height of it. And I'll talk about that more later, but I, I do love the uh, those little shorts. I love Nintendo sponsoring it. Oh, yeah. I love this race because we get a little we get a little bit of shade thrown at a certain black and green truck at the end of this one. <laughs> yeah. Carolina Crusher and Outlaw. Outlaw showing the heat in the motor with some blue smoke pouring out of the top of it. They leave the line, and for about three quarters of this race, it is all Carolina Crusher. And then all of a sudden, top end sneaks by. The, the Outlaw goes on to take the win here, just sneaking past Gary Porter with a surge at the end of the track. And then we get Mike Wine interviewed, and man, if you know a Mike Wine interview, he's going to throw some shade at somebody eventually <laughs> during a night. And Wine throws some shade out to Gravedigger saying, boy, it's a shame Dennis isn't here and that he broke early. He had quite a smile on his face, too, when he says that. Yeah, it was great. I love this. Mike Wine always throwing shade at Digger, too, and Dennis, which would keep going well into the Monster Jam years with Mike Wine, which is great. Oh, yeah. One of the truly great interviews. Goes into the Monster Jam years. Some of it we probably never heard. Oh, man, I'm sure. I can only imagine. I, I would have loved to have been the fly on the wall after some of their conversations because Mike Wine could talk. Yep, one of the all-time great talkers, really. You get Awesome Kong, King Crunch, and Nightlife next. A close race here. Honestly, surprisingly, uh, surprised that Kong wasn't a factor through it at all. And this is kind of the last race that we really see Kong this deep in the bracket. Uh, this entire weekend. It comes down to Crunch and Nightlife. It's a great race between them. The top end starts kicking in for Nightlife, but Crunch has enough of a lead to maintain it and take the win. Yeah, it was another great race. Again, we got my notes, just a just a killer race. And a surprise here to me that King Crunch won this one too. 
yeah, I think everybody's a little surprised, mainly because every time King Crunch j- jumps and lands, you just see the truck just waddles all over the place, yeah. flopping all over the place. Yeah, I mean it's it's working for him, but at the same time, it's hurting him at the same time. I mean, I it's very odd to explain how this truck can make it this far. I know, I know, but he's here. One of the big big finals. Speaking of the next uh, final round competitor here, we got Master Disaster Fanatic and USA One. Chris Chapman gets the chance to talk to Arlene Ed here. Arlene is hum- very humble, saying she didn't think she'd make it this far. She's going to do her best and put her foot put her foot in it and keep her foot in it. I like the interview from Arlene Ed here. Basically, what you have to say at this point. Uh, something to note is Arlene actually makes what many have felt, or Arlene actually has what many have felt to be the preferred lane here, and that's in the center. Master Disaster oddly is going to go to the far right lane. And Wilkie's going to be kicked over to the left. MOD had been previously, I believe, in the center lane this entire show. And then all of a sudden, you're over there. Yep. I don't know how lane choice was determined here. I really don't. I don't either. It's kind of it's confusing how it is, how how it was determined. I don't, yeah. A lot of this race is sort of confusing in how it was handled, I guess, logistically. Yeah, the whole shot, though, going to go to Master Disaster. He keeps the lead all the way down the track. Skies it out again over the cars. Uh, the one camera complaint on this show so far is, though, that they cut away to an ISO camera of USA1 right before the finish. Uh, USA1 and MOD very close here, though. Cinderella story for Fnatic, though, is over with. She stalls out on the second set of cars, though another great race. Yeah, I agree. The camera cuts are bizarre like that because it, it cuts away from what is the really a good race. You can't really see the finish. One thing I really liked here, uh, Doug Spaniard's interviewed after this race. He's not standing in front of his truck. He's standing in front of USA One, who he just beat. I love little little things like that. You're like, oh, you know what? I, I beat this truck behind me. They don't necessarily say it, but you can kind of you, you're kind of like, oh, well, I, I like the way that they interviewed him right there. I don't know why that just stuck with me. Yeah, that's that was pretty funny that they uh, that they did that. I'm curious how how it worked out afterwards. I'm like that, I'm pretty but... sure that uh, Jasmer really loved that interview. I know, which is. It's the way Wilkie was kind of popping off this weekend. It was probably a little bit of nice humble pie. Yeah, just a little bit of humble pie for him. First ever, though, final round, one Ford, one Chevy, one GMC on a three-lane racetrack for monster trucks. I love the final. And the one thing I'm going to point out here, I love the name of it being called the Monster Smash Final. I hated that music. The, the Jaws, it was kind of like Jaws. The yeah, I hate it. I prefer the announcers the building up the tension for a race. I, I hate that they've got that, like you said, the Jaws theme basically building this up. I, it's just dumb to me. It was a grungy sounding music that just had no place in it as far as I was concerned. Yeah, the monster. so the Monster Smash to me when they would do this, I like that it was called the Monster Smash and they did make a big deal out of it that it was the finals. But I also agree that it was kind of bizarre when you would watch this how – the announcers didn't really set anything up. It would just show the trucks like idling. It was all these shots to build the tension, but then the light would just go green, and it was like there's. It was almost too fast. Like there wasn't the real buildup of showing the truck stage. It was just kind of a smash cut, and oh, they're running. Here's the race. Exactly. There's no buildup. There's no talk. There's no nothing leading up to this. They just show that green light going, which I do love, by the way. That the end of this, when they show the green light go, mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah, but. What else, What is what is there to build up at that point? Nothing. They have no time. They just say, and they're green. Yeah, that's that's what. I, and especially for these races that are so short, I think it would make more sense if the races were longer. But these, you're talking about a relatively even. This is a long drag race, but it's still a short race. Yeah, uh, we get a as as soon as the lights go green, quickly cutting to the wheels up start from Monster, or Master of Disaster in the center lane here. Stevens breaks in the far right lane. He's a non-factor. And it's just between Outlaw and Master Disaster here, on, and they are tight on each other. MOD seems to let out of the throttle just a little bit after the wheels up start. Uh, in previous rounds here, you would see Master Disaster get on the throttle and stay on the throttle over those cars. For some reason, after he does this wheels up start, it's almost like Spaniard lets off the throttle just a little bit to get those front tires down on top of the cars so he can kind of drag that no man's land. Problem mm-hmm. is here is Outlaw doesn't have to let off the throttle. It's got a longer wheelbase than Master Disaster. It can stay on the throttle. So through no man's land, they are dead even going to this finish line. And it wasn't really talked about. Again, that's for for all the talk, the useless talk of wheelbases in TNT over the year, it really came in. This was a factor to yes, an iconic race. Factor. And it really 
and it wasn't really talked about. So that was just, it was an interesting gaffe. And I, this is, uh, we can talk at the, at the event wrap up at the first day here, but the commentary, this is like Army and Scott, this is a legendary pairing and they're great on the, they're great on the mic here. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just odd that that was always the well that they would go to was the wheelbase. And it's finally, finally a factor. And it's not, don't even bring it up. Yeah, I know. I know. This is the tightest race of the evening. Doug Spanier Master Disaster takes home the first ever triple lane racing victory, defeating all the big TNT regulars in this field. I believe this was the, I think, second time we saw Master Disaster on TV this year. And it shows up and takes a win over big names like Bigfoot, USA One, King Crunch, Gravedigger. A heck of a win for Doug Spanier here. Probably the biggest of his career. Army and Scott are going to go back and forth here. Um, and they're going to talk about, uh, they're looking at the diamond vision, which I'm jealous of as appears to have several angles of this race that we didn't get to see on TV. If you look up at it, you can kind of see different angles here. Uh, it's funny to hear Scott Douglas basically throw it to himself because <laughs> he throws it to the live event announcer who also happens to be Scott Douglas. Yeah. Which is, which is him doing it, which, yeah, it's funny. We hear the time 6.19 master disaster, 6.23 for outlaw. Very, very tight race. One of the all-time great races, and I, you as they're standing out there, you know how the drivers are standing out on the trucks. Yeah, you know, kudos to Mike Wine here, who Mike Wine was always a, you know, kind of the the cocky, funny interview, but I thought he handled this loss, which he clearly, you could tell, wanted this win so bad in the new truck, and he, I thought his sportsmanship was great here that he handled yes. that uh, well, and I think better than some of the other drivers would have. Oh, yeah, especially at this time. Like I said, there's a lot of energy in this weekend due to the Bigfoot 8 banning. Oh, yeah. A lot of guys feeling that they've, they've suddenly oh, – that big that TNT's basically opened a, a wide-open door for them to be competitive again because there was a lot of people that were just really angry at the fact that Bigfoot had this such technologically advantaged truck, and they didn't. Yep, I exactly. Uh and, you know, we didn't, again, with the announcers, I just wanted to talk about that because we're at the end of day one now. Yes. And Scott and Army were great. This is a, for this big iconic event, of course, you have the iconic announcers there too, which I thought really helped it out as well. And Chris was a great, Chris Chapman was a great pit reporter too. I just, I like how they interviewed everybody and they could capture kind of the drama that was going on here. And uh, they did, they did a great job despite my you know, I'm just poking fun sort of about the wheelbase discussion, just how that was always such a discussion. But it was they did a great job and they really helped to make this seem like a an even bigger event. Yeah. And they, I mean, my God, this was probably to this point in the season, the best produced show that they did. Great production. Again, classic monster truck racing. This is the height of it, I think. Points after night one, uh, Bigfoot, that 11-point lead gets cut just a little bit. 323 to equalizers, 319. King Crunch still very much in this at 315. Gary Porter's Carolina Crusher, fourth, 272. Awesome Kong, 269. That's your top five. Uh, Digger coming in at sixth. USA one, seventh. Buffalo Tremor, eighth. Nightlife, ninth. And the Outlaw is tenth. Yeah, kind of funny how Grave Digger so far behind here. There's such a big split between those top five. Yeah, and he was, the top like I said at the beginning really... of this show, Digger was the point leader after Charleston, West Virginia. I know. And now it's sixth, distant yeah. sixth. There's a, a distinct gap here between fifth and sixth, 69 points. Nice. Yeah, it, it, again, it seems crazy how that works. And yeah, definitely for we talk Cinderella stories. This is definitely has to be Doug Spanier's biggest event yeah. win ever. And One thing Doug, I will say here at the end of this episode, Doug Spanier lost his life in 2017. He passed away from cancer. This is easily the biggest win Master Disaster ever got. And this event in particular is still why I remember the name Master Disaster. Same. If not for this event, I don't, I mean, you and I, of course, are nerds about it. We know a lot of the old trucks, but this, it's not just that it won this event. I think it's it's how, because you would see sometimes in old monster truck racing a Cinderella who would go far, but a lot of times it would be because other people kind of lost, not that they had won. He yeah. won every one of these races and it, ran not, hard. Not only did he win every one of these races, he's doing stuff that guys in Lee sprung trucks weren't doing. Launching the wheels up off the start, launching that second set of cars just as hard as he possibly could. Doug Spanier wanted to win that race more than anybody there, and that's exactly why he did. Yeah, and you also, he, he it wound up with some iconic shots from this event, too, especially from that run, the bounce run, if yeah. you want to call it that, when the truck just lands the third gear afterburner uh, run. 
just really, really cool. And it, it's cool to see this, that, that this truck won this event, I guess, in a, in a cool final round, sort of, you know, full of trucks that you necessarily wouldn't think would be there given the other trucks in the lineup. Yeah, very true. It, trucks that you didn't, would not expect to see in a final round in this caliber of a lineup. A brand new outlaw, a freshly painted King Crunch, and then Master Disaster, who, let's be fair, hadn't been on the circuit at all up to this no. point. No, and here's a fun what if. We could ask this here, or we could ask it even after night two, but we talk about the banning of Bigfoot 8. I don't know if there's a guarantee Bigfoot 8 does just go through this field, because at this time, the truck had the major issues with going straight, and this is a yes. long course, and it yes, could have it easily is. shot off to the side. Now, think about that for a second. We kind of, we uh, maybe alluded to this in one of our Trigger King shows here a little while back. If Bigfoot 8 shows up to this event and they don't ban it, they find out a lot earlier about the suspension issue that they had about the truck wanting to kick to the right or kick to the left after the first set of cars. That makes that truck very dangerous when they go outdoors if they find that earlier. Yeah, right now. If they had found it out and with the whole team down there for this big uh, prestigious of an event. Uh -huh. because unlike even like the Albuquerque's, which was a really small venue, this is basically an outdoor track that's indoors. It's a dome. Yes. And uh, another fun what if is with all the breakage and the other stuff here and the high speeds, who knows if with Bigfoot 8 at this time, which had that suspension issue, that would shoot off to the side. Who knows if it gets into a wall or another competitor or something yeah. and, and breaks. It could have significant breakage. So who... Again, it's a fun what if question, but yeah, I don't know. And again, it's this is all what if stuff. This isn't like we're we're actually saying this would have happened. No, this is just it's a hypothetical stuff that we're tossing out right here that could have happened with uh, number eight. It could have also happened with number four. It, it could have, sure. And I guess my whole point to even bringing this up because you could what if anything is just it seems like a lot of people always assume, well, if Bigfoot Eight was here or if it wasn't banned, Bigfoot Eight just wins every race. Well, no, because. I don't think that's guaranteed at all when it was in its, especially in its me mechanical state that it was uh, with them still trying to figure stuff out on a long, treacherous track like this anyways, with other guys running real fast. Yes. So I guess, yeah, now it probably has a better showing than Bigfoot 4 here, which was broken down most of the time, but still. Yeah. Let's cut to day two, though. Uh, we get a recap of Bigfoot 8's banning by Scott Douglas. Chris Chapman will give us even more of an update later. Army is standing by with Doug Spanier, though, to talk about last night's upset win. Doug, you proved something to a lot of people. You don't have to run on this circuit all the time to be a winner. And Doug says, nope, you sure don't. We've been beefing up this truck in certain areas to bring it out and show what we can do with it. I don't know that pointing that out at the beginning of your episode is smart because that throws every one of your superstars straight under the bus. Yeah, it it is interesting how this works from a... You know, like you know, the putting over, <laughs> you're yeah. you're sort of, uh, you're burying your other talent, <laughs> to use a wrestling term, a little bit. Um, but but I guess I think they always do try and play up the drama of the smaller trucks that are clearly, uh, let's, let's be straight here, they're kind of filler trucks. Yeah. Well, finally, one of them does fantastic and actually comes out and wins. So they're, they're trying to hype that up, you know, that, hey. Look, anybody truly can come out here and win one of these races, I guess. But I do see your point that they're kind of putting down their, their stuff. But here we are. So night two. The theme of night two is survive. <laughs> I also think. the Texas Cup. Yes. Oh, which, yeah, the Texas they hype Cup. At the end, which I found funny. They hype that at the end of the episode of uh, day one. They're like, they're going to be racing for the Texas Cup. And then they come in and they don't even hardly mention the Texas Cup until towards the end of the broadcast in day two. Yeah, and I don't understand how that was awarded either, because I, I would assume it's a combination of a, how you ran both days, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know either. Some we'd have to ask some TNT guys from back in the day, I guess. Uh, we got a highlight video of the previous day where we're seeing that wild semifinal again with Doug. And one thing that I didn't catch in day one when I was initially watching the episode that I did hear was when they slowed that down and you saw how far he actually bounces almost out of the cab of the truck. His whole left arm is hanging out of that truck. I know. It's a hard it hit, It is insane man. to think that, to think about that and how close he actually came to falling out of that vehicle. I know. Chris Chapman updates us on Bigfoot 8 here. The graphic pops up on the screen and it reads, TNT Motorsports, official ruling, Bigfoot 8. When new trucks currently under construction are completed, Bigfoot 8 will be permitted to return. Again, Asinine. <laughs> I don't, 
Yeah, this whole part here, I think, really shows. We'll, we'll finish finish here what she says, and we'll talk about it. TNT Motorsports official ruling: Monster trucks. All engines will now be limited to a maximum size of 500 cubic inches. According to Chris Chapman, the 500 cubic inch rule will take place after Dallas. She then speaks about possible suspension rulings coming later. Yeah, so this this tells you that TNT has sort of lost control. It, this is this is what it, that tells me that is that yeah. TNT has lost control. The inmates are running the asylum, sort of, and they're trying <clears throat> trying to put a genie back in the bottle of something here. Because you've got, I think you have too many variables in play here going on with these suspensions. But trying to mess with the engine rule here seems like they're, again, trying to appease somebody else and trying yeah, to. It, it, I don't understand. It's like they're trying to appease several people at once here. And that's something that you don't see in major motorsports like NASCAR, like the NHRA. The rules at the beginning of a NASCAR season, if, if, unless it's a dra- like unless it's something that everyone agrees on, they are not going to change those rules. Yeah, or safety or something that's clearly like, hey, this has right, to be addressed safety ASAP. Issue. Like, we'll uh, use Ryan Newman last year for an example. After the uh, the Daytona accident, they added a bar in the in the chassis for everybody directly after that race. Yeah, yeah, and that you would. I mean, that's not that's that's common in motorsports. But to yes. have the rule, the an engine rule, like you have two major things that they're throwing out here. One. They clearly don't know what to do on the suspension ruling yet because, and I, and again, I'm not trying to throw shade necessarily because it was very complicated. Yeah. But putting the, I feel like, boy, that's a big enough battle right there, but then to limit the engine too. And I think that's a pretty significant, the 500 rule, you got, who's all running bigger stuff? Because I'm trying to think, what was Bigfoot running at the time? 540s? Um, 540 or 572. I can't remember off the top USA of my head. As as what was I know five. USA 1 was the, the truck probably hurt the worst by this. Yeah, because they were running the a 572, right? The big. Yeah, they were running a big motor. The big <laughs> it Chevy, shows in this uh, event. They were definitely running a big motor. What was Dennis running at this time? Because he didn't have uh, the He definitely didn't have the Rodec at this point. Okay. <laughs> I believe it was a regular, I think it was a a four, wasn't a 454. I can't, I can't remember. I have to, I have to do some more research and try to find that out. Regardless, it's just, uh, again, this tells me, so this also feels like sort of the, the beginning of the end, I guess, which maybe I should save this for the wrap up, but I feel like this event is the height of TNT and it also shows how it's going to unravel. Unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, let's get into it, though. We get into qualifying yeah. here, and right off the bat, we've got more drama. Master Disaster, Clydesdale, Wild Hair, all three trucks running hard here. Clydesdale, out of the three, surprisingly gets the faster time at the finish line over the truck that won the night before. Problem is, Wild Hair gets one heck of a bounce at the rear of the track, and all of a sudden, Clydesdale's rolling over. Like When you first look at this, you're like, what the heck just happened? And when they slow it down, you see Wild Hair comes across the track after... Honestly, when you look at that run again from Wild Hair, truck's completely straight until the last car. Something mm-hmm. happens in the rear end of that truck on the last car that kicks it to the right. Bennett sees it out of the corner of his eye, starts to throttle up just a little bit, but by that point, Wild Hair's already making contact in his left rear, and Clydesdale rolls over into the tunnel. This hit reminds me of almost like a croquet ball whenever you play croquet and you hold the one ball and you hit through the mallet and the energy transfers. It's one of those things to where it doesn't look like it'd be that much, but boy, when it hits, there was a major energy transfer that happened of there kinetic go, energy. Gentlemen, the it, first time in history you're hearing monster trucks compared to croquet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like that, That's why you have me on this show. No, I, I can't think of any other like an energy transfer like that because it doesn't look like the hit was so hard to kick a big heavy truck over like that. Boy, that energy transfer. It's, it's, just, actually, it's a really good analogy because it does happen in this sport quite a bit where the energy transfers from one side to the other. Uh, one thing that popped into my mind as you were talking about that was uh, a few years later in Penda when Jersey Outlaw lands and the whole suspension just erupts underneath the truck and it bounces higher than it actually jumped coming down. Oh, uh, yeah. I know what you're talking about. There. Yeah, yeah, that, again, that was some a, energy transfer right there, let me tell you. Yeah, the kinetic stuff, it's got to go somewhere, and that's what happens here. And I think because this, this uh, really – hurts the uh, uh, wild hair here, doesn't it? It hurts wild hair more than it does Clydesdale. And that just Clydesdale tells you Clydesdale comes back energy. and competes. 
Yeah, because, oh, yeah, we'll talk about that. You know, Bennett comes back, and that truck is <laughs> is ripped apart later. Oh, yeah, it's completely, it's not completely destroyed, but it's it's still competitive. Wild Hair, on the other hand, the right front tire is kind of hanging off of it, and uh, it's not until, like, a second replay, or, excuse me, a second interview later on that we hear Marvin Smith actually say that he broke the frame in half when he hit Bennett. Yeah, and that just tells you all that, how much energy transferred, and that's why Clydesdale, a, again, a long wheelbase truck, just kicks it over like a toy. Exactly. One thing I do want to point out here, though, if you look at this, Doug, and you see where the incident actually happens, and you see where Wild Hair runs into a hay bale, the day before, that very hay bale had a cameraman standing behind it. Yes, and I remember that. And so they, it's good that they realized, hey... This is a death race. We exactly. need to get our guys off the floor here because, yeah, and then we'll, and they change the ramps too. Yeah, they changed. Well, I don't know. I kind of agree with what Steve Wilkie says a little bit later in this broadcast about the ramps. He said they really all they did was just bring them to the top of the cars because they got beat down the day before. But it it has it, it, it does ha it does have an effect. They don't get beat down quite as much as they did the day before. Yes, and so it. I mean, again, we'll kind of get to it here, but again. It feels like day two, this is part of the theme is survive. The trucks yeah. have already ran hard on this day one, you know, hitting walls, hitting other trucks, hitting hay bales, hitting all this stuff. And now we're at day two and the equipment is just, it's like tapping out. <laughs> really. Oh, yeah. It, it's every, almost every truck here is hurt in some way. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I would, another thing I'd like to point out here. First thing that Army asked Bennett Clark, Bennett, are you okay? Start asking this to drivers again. Mm -hmm. They need to start asking this to guys when they get out of the trucks anymore because, yeah, they appear okay when they're interviewed, but people like to know, hey, man, are you okay after that? I don't care if it's a light rollover. I don't care if it's a, a tire that popped off and they got out of the truck. Ask them if they're okay. You talking about Monster Jam in general? Anything, or? anything. Oh, yeah. Any promoter out there, nobody walks up, puts their arm around the guy and says, man, are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, it's like they're it's uh it's expected almost. Yeah, it's just like they're expected to be okay when they hop out of these trucks, and that's necessarily not the case sometimes. They're I know we're one of the most technologically advanced safety sports in the world, but drivers can still be hurt. It's as, you know it's really kind right. of a wonder. If they're not all right, they're not going to tell you. Well, yeah, and it's it's a well, that's a whole thing too. Yeah, but, we could get into that later. <laughs> yeah, that it it is a uh, an interesting thing with monster trucks to where, I mean, it's more of the show, I guess, aspect of it, right? So some of the guys aren't going to say they're hurt, even if they are. But uh, it is a wonder in monster trucks with how hard the trucks are pushed these days. That again, that for the most part, I guess it's just it's a it just talks about how well engineered everything is. That there there hasn't really been a major incident with a driver. Yeah, uh, thankfully, thankfully. But one thing I'd point out is that I mean. Sometimes they don't, but sometimes they do. In NASCAR, after a hard wreck and a driver comes out of the infield care center, that's the first thing they're asked. Are you okay? Yeah, sure. It makes it feel like more of a motorsport. I when agree. They're asking you're, that. So that's why I think they need to start asking that again. That's one thing that's always driven me nuts. If I, uh, let's, I'll use uh, Pontiac, the last Pontiac show, for example, when Dennis Anderson does that cartwheel into the dumpster. Oh, the, first yeah. thing that, the first thing nowadays fans look at when they see that is, man, that's a wild wreck. Man, that was awesome. That was awesome. Old school fan in me jumps out. God, I hope he's all right. Of course. And it also does help. I know it's a small thing, but you say it makes it feel more like a motorsport. It builds the drama a little bit. You should ask. You shouldn't take... You shouldn't take it for granted, and it, it's just one of those little things if you are an announcer, I think. It helps to just build the drama that, oh, yeah, there is danger in this. It's not just trucks in this show. It's, exactly. There's actually danger. Army was fantastic at always Yes, that. he was. Army was fantastic at this, and especially when he goes to interview Marvin, the first Marvin interview in this show. He says, hey, uh, just so you know, Bennett is okay, and Marvin looks has this relieved look on his face and says he's so happy to hear that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Just reassures everybody that everything is is good after an accident like that. Yeah. Uh, the good news is though for Bennett, he gets some uh, gets some playing power here from Nintendo as he becomes the subject of uh, the now you're playing with power segment, the power play. Yes. Again, I love this segment. I love the, <laughs> uh, you know, I love the uh, the marketing that's going on here. This is at the NES when the NES was at its height. Super Nintendo was going to be coming out a year later, and every the Nintendo was just huge. This is a big get for them for yes. uh, for the TNT people. Yep. 
Uh, Clydesdale with a 6.59 fastest time of that pair. And we're only one pair in so far after all that. <laughs> Great digger, awesome Kong and Nightlife, the next pair right here. Digger looks okay on this pass, though, after not being able to compete in uh, day one. Dennis cuts, uh, cuts a really good race right here. He finishes, I believe, right behind Nightlife in this. Uh, it's very close between them time-wise, 6.23 to 6.29. And then we've got Kong here with a 6.89. But Kong has a ton of smoke pouring out of it, and that's a theme this entire show for Awesome Kong. They just can't seem to get that truck going. Yep, it's just it kind of plagued here. It's a little bit snake bit in the rest of the way. And Gene Patterson, I want to point out, probably was not the reason why. Anyway, snake bite jokes aside, Barbarian and Outlaw, King Crunch here. Outlaw gets a great launch in the center lane, but then seems to start cutting out over the first uh, set of cars here. Slow, going really slow in no man's land. Outlaw doesn't even can finish the pass. Uh, even though when I watched this back, I could have swore I saw Outlaw's tires on the last car. So I thought, well, it looks like he did. But when they cut back and they show it, it's actually sitting just before the finish line. So Outlaw D and Q's. King Crunch goes to 6.29, same time as Gravedigger, and mm -hmm. Barbarian, a distant, distant 7.72. We don't need to talk about Jim Miller. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is where the second Marvin Smith interview happens, and that's where he says that his truck's ruined. Uh, basically broke the frame in half. According to Marvin, he's going to have to build a new truck. I don't know necessarily that he's going to build a new truck, but he's definitely going to need a new frame if it is indeed broken in half. Yeah, again, just shows how hard of a hit that was. Buffalo Tremor, Equalizer, Micro Machines. We get some uh, a little bit of a background on the X-Mud racer, Kurt Fisher, as well as some talk about the fresh paint scheme on Equalizer. Army says the only thing really consistent in this pass from uh, previous episodes is Buffalo Tremor. It still looks the exact same, Buffalo Tremor number two. All the trucks here have a great pass. They set times. And the interesting thing to note here is when you watch this back, Micro Machines get a hell of a launch off those first, uh, first sets of cars. And all of a sudden, No Man's Land, it just seems like that truck just tops out. Yeah, it would have been it'd be interesting. Like this, this is he it looked like he was on like a TQ run. Oh yeah, he was easily mid fives. Uh, he had about a truck and a half length lead on Equalizer, and by the time they finish, Equalizer has a truck length lead. So he passed that much of a distance between the middle of No Man's Land and the finish line on uh, Kurt here. Hard yeah. landing though for Equalizer though. You watch that front end just come down and you get boom, 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 really hard on that front end as he's hitting the brakes. Just a rough pass for Equalizer. Yeah, it's not a very good one. I mean, it's still that time was a very fast time though. Yeah, six point one three is not nothing to nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, if you had compared it to the night before, especially, but still, it was a, it was a rough pass on the truck. Bigfoot and USA One here is the next two to come out, and this pass is one that I I really remember from back in the day. A Fanatic is out there for some reason. It's it's off the line. It's backed up. But anyway. Bigfoot USA one racing against each other here. The rivalry kind of renewed and qualifying. Uh, we get some, in, there is some MCAB footage of this that has circulated through Bigfoot for a number of years. Yep. And you see Pyant inside the cab and USA one is the first to cross the line here, but the in cab shot of Pyant, if you could ever find this in cab shot, it's something to behold because watching USA one get closer and closer. And then all of a sudden, all you see is USA one's right rear tire go right past the driver's side window of Bigfoot and how close they actually got to each other. They do touch the left front and the right rear of USA one do barely touch each other right here. But man, that in cab shot is just scary to look at. Could have been really dangerous of a hit. Yeah. But speaking of he... dangerous hits though, the end of the track, that poor generator. <laughs> oh, I know. I know, oh, man. man. It just anything so... down there anywhere. At this point, is almost like okay, yeah. You you know anything down there is sort of fair game at this point. They have a clock down there for this used for the Dallas Cowboys that uh, their quarterback would basically look at to see what the play clock was basically, and they had that covered up with a piece of plywood because that's going to protect it. But <laughs> know, the generator down there that's the that's the big story here. Wilkie hits this generator. And slides, and honestly, I think that if the hay bale doesn't actually get caught up under USA One, he hits the wall, and that truck is destroyed. Yep. That hay it bale like, absorbs a lot of the impact. Yep, it looks like that he really got saved here by that, because it looks like that would have been a catastrophic wreck, and that one could have really hurt him, too, Steve. Yes. I mean, he... Let's let's just say here, fastest times of the weekend from both of these trucks, 5.885 for USA1 and 5.95 for Bigfoot. So only a tenth of a second. But man, 
Steve Wilkie dodges a heck of a bullet here, and he's extremely happy, as, as I would be too, after dodging that bullet. Chris Chapman interviews him after the end, and he simply replies, it's quick, going fast. Big <laughs> grin on his face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, man, that, um, and he's cocky after this one too. Oh, yeah, Bigfoot, all he saw was my tailgate. Which is nonsense because, I mean, yeah. hey, I know it's crap talk, but these are, like, these are the two... These are two passes that would have won any round. Oh yeah, um, and they're both right by each other. Yeah, this uh, that generator. You know, I, I saw that. Um, you know, it's probably expensive. Oh yeah, definitely. This weekend had to have been pretty expensive for TNT to put on this show because you had so many crush cars. I don't. I mean, so many rude. crush cars. So many damage damage to the wall. Yep. Damage to a generator that's owned by the Cowboys. And to be fair, when you look out in the crowd and you see how many people are there, I don't think that they, I think that might've been a, a, a net loss for them. That's what, I, so I wanted to talk about the crowd. This is a good time to get into it because I remembered, I don't know what I remember, but in watching this, I was thinking of it. This is probably an expensive building to run. You had all these trucks here. You had all this damage that was going on and the, the, you had the side section that was relatively filled, but you, it wasn't. I don't know, maybe you, don't know, it's just, you don't know what's behind the hard camera either. So there's yeah. probably there's probably a good side that's probably pretty full as well. But the end zones, upper deck, nobody. Yeah, and you know, I wonder though if we're just skewed. Well, first off, yes, with the hard camera, if they had a big crowd on that hard camera side, that probably was a pretty big gate that they took in. I'm just curious that uh, maybe now when we look back at it, because we're used to seeing full stadiums. Yeah. And that wasn't the case back then necessarily. Even I'm trying to think of those Pontiac shows. Maybe some of the really old ones when it was like a new gimmick, but I don't remember. For the most part, it was on the sides. For the most part, wasn't it that they would fill up in some of those stadiums? I can't really pretty think. Pretty close, yes. Or like during um, when they'd run those big California stadiums or other things where the USHRA would be running pulling tracks like down the third and first baselines. Yeah, you have the crowd like there, but you wouldn't have many in the outfields. So I don't know. I was wondering the same thing. I remember thinking like, oh man, I wonder if this was even financially viable to do this event. But it, I mean, it probably was. Uh, if that hard camera side is full, then they probably did okay, I suppose. If not, though, I would yeah, think, I don't know, yeah. but I mean, they probably did okay, but they probably lost the net worth of any profit they made paying back the building for the damage. They had to fix a wall. They yeah, I don't know what that, insurance that looks generator. like but yeah, like I don't know what insurance was like either. But man, they they probably lost a fair bit of chunk of that. And again, though, there's a lot of dirt and a lot of cars that were in there too, like yes. a lot of a lot of stuff that they had to run that event. So and with the three lanes even. So I don't. I'd be curious to see what it looked like. But I did have that same thought. I wondered if this was a financially viable weekend for them. Last race here. Excuse me. Last qualifying pass here. Tough enough. Carolina Crusher and Fanatic. Arlene Ed is probably happy she wasn't in that last battle. That's the only thing I could think of here. She's yeah. watching those two trucks go down the track, and she's sitting. There. She's still sitting in that leather lane. I don't know why. Maybe the only thing I can think of is maybe she just didn't want to be a part of that and just wanted to say, you know what, you two guys go. I'll go ahead and be in the next pair, which proved to be very smart because you had Pablo Cruz and Gary Porter, two very smart drivers right here. Uh, Porter leaves the line and is the fastest of the pair, but you could definitely sense Gary is kind of easing off the throttle here. I want to say a 50% pass from Gary. I uh, believe he runs a 6.36, which is a very competitive pass, but at the same time for Gary Porter, who can probably push faster than that, it's very conservative. He let up. I mean, I think this is obvious. This night becomes obvious to where the guys are starting to lay off if they can. Yeah, especially and after that last pass with USA 1, I'm I'm very certain that they're laying off. And speaking of that, we get into round one, USA 1 tough enough in Carolina Crusher. What does Steve Wilkie do? He lets off. Obviously, to slow that truck down at the end, Gary actually gets the advantage of him here. But in the interview, you hear uh, Steve Wilkie say, you know what? Top two advance anyway. Yeah, it's the strategy is finally coming. Strategic in. play. Very strategic. Yep. Yep. Army Armstrong interviews Porter. He says he'd love to have. Honestly, I would love to have the hat that he's wearing here. Baby blue Carolina Crusher hat. I, I noticed that, too. I thought that. It doesn't like, even Man. match anything to do with the truck because the truck's <laughs> yellow. But that baby blue hat's like, you know what? I'd love to have me one of those. Yep. With just his baby. logo on it. I loved it. Gary explains that the uh, the next round is going to be a little tougher. Or, excuse me, Army explains 
to Gary that this has been a tough night of monster truck racing. And Gary says it's tough. It's very tough. All the big names are here in this competition and it's getting really tough this year qualifying. We had a couple of accidents and I didn't like the lane I was qualifying in. So I sort of laid back. So Gary admits right here that he's laying back. He goes on to explain that he's going to be a hundred percent in eliminations, which he was because he just took out the number one qualifier. He beat him, but he's the number one qualifier still coming back. Yeah, and again, this is where Steve Wilkie really laid it off, and he knew, hey, top two, I need to save this equipment because qualifying is one thing, I suppose. But yeah, USA won. It's kind of a, it's it that it even held together with some of the hits it's made here in this event. Oh yeah, and then this one, this one was a more strategic pass for Wilkie because that's exactly what he was trying to do was just test out the equipment a little bit. Uh, basically, Chris Trapman says, "Hey, Steve Wilkie, you just got beat." He still can't stop grinning, too. That's the best part. Is Steve Wilkie's still grinning this entire, almost this entire interview. Well, I didn't get beat by much. <laughs> love that I little love quote it. there uh, because he did because he hit the wall before. He didn't want to go out and do it again. Didn't go all out. He just wanted to see if the truck would stay together. The first two people across the line advanced. That's all I'm worried about. Yeah, and he again smart play here because he figured those two were. He probably didn't have to run super hard to get ahead of tough enough. So no, he didn't have to run super hard. Run past Pablo Cruz. Uh, Gary Porter, on the other hand, probably would have. But Gary, even again in this pass, doesn't look like he's going 100%. Uh, yeah. Nightlife, though, taking on Buffalo Tremor right here. No third truck in this pair due to breakage. They don't mention who was supposed to be in this pair. Uh, I'm assuming Gravedigger, but I'm not sure. Uh, these two trucks run very hard and almost appear to be having the exact same pass here. Synchronized monster truck racing. This is where you're kind of like, what? At the end, because they call Buffalo Tremor the winner. But when you look at the video, Nightlife's about a quarter of a tire tread ahead. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with this one. Luckily, though, it really didn't matter. I don't know if it was a production gaffe or something. But because two trucks advanced, it really wasn't a a thing. That's why it wasn't, wasn't a thing. But at the same time, you're like, I call the right winner. Yeah, I know. And it, it looked like this was a – again, I wonder if it was a production, just some kind of a gaffe. Or with the, didn't the generator take out the timing equipment? Uh, I believe that is the, the the legend anyway. I don't know if that's – like I said, we got to talk to people from TNT that were actually there. So if anybody's listening to this podcast that worked for TNT Motorsports and can clarify that, I would greatly appreciate it. Yeah, so that might have been something that happened there. But I agree with you. It looked like the wrong guy got called the winner. Yeah. Um, one thing here to point out is Chris Chapman congratulates Johnny K like he won the entire event. I know. <laughs> Afterwards, you're like, "Why? Congratulations on taking out nightlife!" And I'm like, "Who cares? It's round one." Even Johnny mm -hmm. K's kind of got that look on his face, like, "Okay, thanks." Uh, Johnny K does explain though that his brakes are overheating, but they'll be all right. Judging from the previous pass that he made the day before, I'm not so sure about that. I know. Bigfoot, Barbarian, and Fanatic right here on paper. This is a complete mismatch if I've ever seen one. Pyant interviewed here quickly. Uh, it's kind of like a picture-in-picture kind of thing. Uh, quickly asked about the front steering cylinders that appear to be broken qualifying. He said, when me and Steve were running, I had to get on the brakes really hard, and we kind of came together. I got on the brakes too hard, and the front springs, excuse me, the front springs wound up. Traction bars hit the steering rams, and it bent both of them, and it also broke a shock. Yeah, Spence rough a pass for Bigfoot. Yeah, I'm going to say that was, it sounds like that was a really rough one. A lot of breakage on it. Chris asked if he'll still have brakes, and he says, oh, yeah, except he won't have rear steering. So Bigfoot's no got no rear steering. And then after this pass, which Bigfoot goes out and wins, the transmission's slipping. <laughs> yeah, just a mechanical, uh, terrible mechanical weekend for four. So one thing that you can point out here that could be attributing to this is Pyant probably ran the week before with this truck. Mm-hmm. Did they have enough time to try to get this truck completely race ready before they went to Dallas and finding out the rule change? When did that phone call come in and say, hey, by the way, you can't bring eight? I, I guarantee that's why. I mean, you never – how often do you ever see a Bigfoot truck in this era that's mechanically, you know, screwy, especially – and it seemed like it was like that right from the event. I Bigfoot 8 was on the premises here, wasn't it? That I don't know. I, I couldn't get a yes or a no answer to that one. Uh, one thing I do know is on the schedule that I was given from Bigfoot, it's lists Bigfoot four for this weekend. I couldn't. So the only reason I asked that, for some reason, I thought I had heard that the truck left or, or that was down there or something. I don't know. I could be wrong on that. So apologies if that's the case. I remember there's a lot of weird stories around this event and a lot of he said, she said, she said, I can't even talk 
uh, kind of thing about it. But as far as um, four, though, I guarantee that's why four just wasn't ready for this event. It wasn't it sure as heck wasn't ready to do battle in one of the hardest monster truck tracks ever. Like yeah, exactly. And you had a rookie driver here for Bigfoot behind the wheel as well. Yeah. John Pyant is not necessarily used to this kind of racing. He does well in this type of event down the road and a couple of events down the road here, though, not so much. I think this yeah. is probably one of the reasons why they pulled Pyant for Louisville and they put brass in the truck. Uh, yeah, I think so. And I'd be curious what brass would have done here. Now, I mean, I don't know how Andy really would have done if the mechanical stuff was bad because Andy was here. You could see. Yes. I just I don't know. Uh, mechanically, if the truck really would have made a difference, who was driving with all the gremlins and stuff going on? Uh, one thing uh, to say here: Barbarian uh, years ago went on sale, and one of the things that it said in the listing was beats the Bigfoot and Gravedigger monster trucks. A lot of good that did him right here. Anyway, mm -hmm. on to the next pass. Uh, we get Mike Wine showing out back here with his crew working together after or before round one, trying to get it together. As we come back from commercial, we see here comes Clydesdale missing a few pieces, but it's in fact intact enough to race. And then really quick, Dennis is getting out of Digger too, and he's not happy. Digger won't be making a pass this round. Dennis says the truck wouldn't crank at the line. There's something wrong with it before it even went out there. I've had tough luck all weekend and I'm getting fed up. And you can see there was another four letter word on Dennis's mind. Oh, he's <laughs> angry. He was not happy. Uh, and before this actually happens, uh, in that Bigfoot run that we just saw. You could see Digger sitting across the track and it was facing towards the tunnel. And it kind of had me scratching my head. I was like, why is Dennis's truck facing towards the tunnel right here? Shouldn't he be lined up getting ready to go to the line? Well, this explains exactly that, why the truck was facing that way. It was probably getting ready to be towed back out. Yep. He's about as angry as you'll ever see Dennis on camera here. Oh, yeah. He is fuming. He, you don't ever see Dennis Anderson get, I mean, you've seen him mad. But you don't see him as mad as he is here. He literally almost lets the F-bomb slip on TV. I know, I know. <laughs> Master of Disaster and Clydesdale right here. Army Armstrong, do you believe in miracles? That old classic miracle quote. Uh, Clydesdale takes the win over Master of Disaster. Quite a bit of a shocker here. Uh, I know the next the Master of Disaster is going to advance anyway, but still, you go out, you've rolled over in qualifying, you come out and you beat the truck that won the event the day before. Yeah, it's, this is one of the better runs Clydesdale's had at, at this event. The truck's running pretty well, it seems like. And it's I don't know if he already, since he rolled over, he kind of just figured, well, what the heck, I'm going to go hard as I can. Mm -hmm. But uh, broken Clydesdale seems to be running great. Oh, yeah. Army, uh, Bennett, it's been a long night in Texas. What's new, son? Wraps him, grabs his arm around him, and Bennett goes, shoot, it's tough down here. Boy, I had to watch that back because I literally thought he said another <laughs> word that begins with S. <laughs> yeah. But man, he, the way Bennett looks at Army here too. I, you know what? I need, him, I need me a woman the way that Bennett, Bennett looks at Army. We'll put it that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, <laughs> Army's That's the next great monster too. truck meme, people. Make it happen. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Just getting thrown off. Just like getting thrown off a bull, you got to get back up and go again. Great quote from Bennett Clark here, who is a former bull rider. Mm-hmm. Equalizer, Outlaw, Micro Machines. Something to note here, Equalizer, almost red lights. If you he watch moves. this race, it he, like. he barely moves, but it's not enough to trip that timing beam or the light. And Holbrook, as he budges, the light starts to go green. He moves again when the light goes green. And Micro Machine has its best pass of the weekend, gets out early and holding on to beat Equalizer across the line right here. However, again... Equalizer runs second and will be coming back because Outlaw is after the first set of cars is done. Yeah, it's a shame. I feel like Outlaw the night before just took its toll. Finally, yeah, running I mean, that deep you in think the finals. He was running, running 280 coming out into the final round. Yeah. He ran as hard as he could to try to win that event. And like we said, brand new truck here might not have had everything that they probably needed on it, as such as the electrical fans and stuff like that. I imagine that motor got cooked the night before. Mm-hmm. Uh, same thing. I think it was just, it just didn't have anything left, really. Greg Holbrook says, we're getting all sorts of air tonight. He's not wrong. Greg watching the replay here is f really funny to me. I got him. I got him by a wheel. But no, that, that, uh, he's... You lost. <laughs> I know. Like, come <laughs> on, man. Horribly. Typical racer. Typical racer. You love his, I got him. No, you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you lost. Sorry. But yeah. anyway. 
next battle here awesome kong and king crunch battle of texas right here crunch oh this one this is going to be fun to talk about after. oh yeah king crunch gets the win here uh with kong having motor issues seems like it's going away army walks up to scott and he says man you're the texas state champion then we hear what scott stevens has to say and he says the main thing i want to want everybody here to out here to see that's been watching these tv races you know, Bigfoot's been dominating for this whole year. Now he's out here racing a truck equal to everybody. Two weeks in a row, he hasn't got past round one. False. Anyway, just like in 89, he didn't have a truck that was equal to compete with everybody, so they stayed home and built something to be 10 years ahead of us. He can't run with us with equal equipment. So this is where the little whiner and crybaby reputation kind of comes in with Scott Stevens. And I'm not saying that he is. He's one of the nicest guys out there. If you've ever met Scott Stevens, a great guy. But right here, for some reason, a lot of, not necessarily just Bigfoot fans, but a lot of Monster Truck fans associated him with a crybaby and whining persona after this interview. I remember this. So I remember this as a person who grew up a Bigfoot fan, how angry this made me. And watching it back, it's funny. Let us let me put the caveat here, because I'm going to go on a rant here, that clearly he... You know, things were hot this weekend. He's clearly mm -hmm. just saying this. He's amped up. He's out of the truck. He's just he's just saying what he can, you know, kind of just getting hopped up. That said, this is one of the dumbest statements I've ever heard. Like, they Bigfoot had no time to get this truck ready. And to, I guess the way he's insulting Bigfoot for the greatest truck of its generation, it just seems, that's the whole crybaby thing, right? It really does come from stuff like this, because it's like, what are you even talking about? Like, they didn't have time to get the truck ready. And this truck has annihilated trucks for years. Yeah, and so... This truck's been around since, what, 85, 86? Yeah, and I and guess to me... So many evolutions over the years. It's won more events than Scott Stevens has probably ever even been to. <laughs> I'm yeah, not, I, I'm not trying to, and again, I'm not throwing Scott Stevens under the bus. I like Scott Stevens. I've met him before. He's one of the nicest guys I've ever met. This interview, though, is not a good look for him. No, it, that, I guess that's my whole point to it. And yes, I don't mean to be talking crap on like Scott Stevens. I, I don't know Scott, I but he's, uh, I know I've heard from so many people he's a good guy. I'm sure he is. And again, this is just getting caught up in it. But at the time, though, I remember I hated King Crunch. And after this, like, I really hated King Crunch as a kid. <laughs> I remember thinking, like, you know, at the time I didn't really know what was going on, but I just remember thinking he was talking crap after the fact and uh, against Bigfoot, and I didn't like that. And um, you could tell it was, like, nasty, though. It was a nasty edge to it. It wasn't like the Mike Wine poking fun at Yeah, Dennis it wasn't Anderson. Mike Wine poking fun. It was more like, okay, you know what? This happened, and now they're running equal, equal equipment to me, and by God, I can beat them with my equipment. And that's, yeah, okay. while Bigfoot's broke, I suppose. But, again, you just look at it, and it's like they, they had no time to get Bigfoot ready. And I know we're, like, overanalyzing something that just was sort of an off-the-cuff, you know, a hot shot remark. But, yeah, at the time, though, I remember as a little kid watching this, and it hacked me off. And I still have the King Crunch bias to this day, in part because of stuff like this. Mm -hmm. I mean... His statement, though, I understand, like, like I said at the beginning of this episode, I understand his frustration as well as everybody else's frustration. The problem with that is, is it was within the rules for them to do exactly what they did. And as far as I'm concerned, if it's not in the rules, they are legally able to do so. Well, it, you know, they could have spent their time putting in a radio system to talk to the crew chief. Which of well, course, yeah, was, they could have done that, or they could have put one of those computers in there so it tells them exactly what the throttle positioning and everything <laughs> I know, is too. I know. I, I'm poking fun at that. I think you've talked about on other shows how they've they've made they again, tried to how make they would that talk about team communications thing. Just oh, this is amazing. NASCAR was doing that for ten years up to that point. Who cares? Yeah, it's a radio and, and it, again, I don't mean to be talking all this crap here, but I can tell you, I can tell you, some of the people at Bigfoot still remember this too. Oh, and I imagine that they do, especially this if it's is a like handler. Yeah, and again, this is like poking the big. This is poking the bear with a stick because when Bigfoot Eight does come back out, it just started. It runs amok basically once they figure stuff out. But it, uh, yeah, this was just funny. I remember watching this, and I I got fired up watching this even again. Some whatever this is, what thirty years later, thirty one <laughs> you know? years now. Yeah, it's it's crazy. So. That's as for what that's all I have to say about that. Okay, Steve Austin. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Awesome Kong, Carolina Crusher, and USA One. Army points out here that the clay in Texas is hard as a rock. 
It may look like dirt, but it's concrete tonight. Texas tough concrete. And basically what he's saying here is, well, it's kind of what we were talking about earlier when they rebuilt the track. They rebuilt the track, I believe, to specifications that they did the day before. The issue that they had here is this is an open-air stadium. Mm. The sun beat down on this course all day long. After they rebuilt these jumps, it hardened this clay up. That's why these ramps aren't going down and being broken down like they were the day before at the event. At least that's yeah. my opinion on it. And I think this event took place in the summer. Yes. Uh, j- uh, maybe June or something. I, so it's my point is it's hot Texas heat. Yeah, it's, it's hot, hot Texas, Texas heat here putting on this. Uh, you see a little bit of frustration here mounting in Steve Wilkie. The engines are hot. He's waving, flailing his arms around inside this cockpit right here, trying to speed everybody up. But Kong has an issue. Kong has five minutes. It doesn't matter if you're pitted 600 yards away or 60 feet away. He still has five minutes, according to the rule book, and that's what they give him here. And Wilkie is frustrated behind the wheel. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, And I don't blame him. I mean, because this is... The time is the time, but boy, the way the strains are on the trucks, and you also, I think, at this point, too, you have guys that are just frustrated. It's been a long weekend, I'm sure, already, and guys have been working. It's hot. I'm sure it's hot. Yeah. Just in the building, I'm sure ambient temperatures are hot. And so, yeah, he's angry. He's just like, come on, get on with the show here, you know, and his truck's overheating at the line there, and I, I totally understand. I understand his frustration, but at the same time, he's – they got to go what's in the rule book. I know. Uh, the, inter- I know. the interesting I, thing here is, is Andy Brass is actually help out, out there helping Kong try to get going here, which, you know, honestly, if he gets Kong going, it kind of benefits Bigfoot a little bit. If Kong goes out there and beats one of the, it beats these guys, it eliminates one of them from the bracket, and they're both up in points. Mm-hmm. So yep. I understand why Brass is out there helping. Um, one thing to note here is the crunch of the week plays while we're waiting for this race, and ironically, it's USA 1 killing a generator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I love that it's like all right here's here's wound up steve wilkie by the way he killed this generator earlier in the evening <laughs> yep anyway not uncommon thing to do here as far as brass helping kong get going to either knock out usa one or crusher it helps bigfoot like i said in the points competition if one of these guys is gone wilkie is on kill though this pass he beats crusher bouncing just as hard if not maybe a little harder than Doug Spanier did the night before. The difference, though, is is there's not a truck in that right lane, and Wilkie, when he bounces, can shoot to the right to get the truck shut down. Yeah, the again, it's just it, it, kind of what we're talking about earlier with all this stuff. It's just uh, trucks are shooting everywhere. Yeah. It's a good thing that Kong wasn't racing in that far lane, though, because Wilkie, like I said, needed every inch of room to get it shut down, and I'm sure Kong would have needed every inch of room as well. And it would have been a third time in the evening that Kong would have had to have dodged Steve Wilkie. Yep. They keep wanting to get together, it seems like. The greatest quote of the night, though, right after this. That's oh, a full yeah. boogaloo double throw down wall slapper right there. Army Armstrong, 1990. I like Scott. I think Scott even said, he's like, can you say that again, Army? He's like, no yeah, Army's like, no. <laughs> Porter explains that he lost a lot of no, time in no man's land right there. That's probably what cost him the win against USA 1. Uh, the next race, though, Bigfoot, Barbarian, Nightlife. Bigfoot has no reverse. Several crew members are showing out there, pushing the truck backwards to get it to the line. Nightlife takes the win here, honestly, in kind of an easy pass. As Pint kind of veers off to the right a little bit in no man's land, and it just seems like Bigfoot just stalls and almost dies. Yeah, it's kind of the end of it here. Uh, you can tell that it, that the, um, it doesn't have much left. Yeah, the fours. Four's next race is probably all that it has left in it at this point. Mm -hmm. To point this out, though, Steven said in his earlier statement that Bigfoot didn't make it out of round two. Well, guess what? Bigfoot makes it out of round two right here, even though it does lose. Clydesdale, Equalizer, and Tough Enough. I'm sure Pablo Cruz was brought back due to breakage right here. Equalizer with the easy win in the near lane. Another, another, Another really good race here is Clydesdale is... I mean, Clydesdale's just consistent. Even after a rollover, it's consistent in this race. Yeah, it, it, the truck looks great. Again, that's yeah. fun. this is one of the best times Clydesdale, again, has ever looked in a race. Buffalo, Tremor, King Crunch, Master Disaster. Spanier gets the lane he's more familiar with from the first day. However, doesn't really work out for him here as there's a lot of bounce. And King Crunch just gets to the cars quicker and he's able to speed right across the finish line and take the win. Which, then again, sets up our final nine trucks again, Doug, here. 
Here and we go. Yep. A lot of trucks, again, probably eliminated due to breakage here, but Final Nine, Master Disaster, Tough Enough, and USA One. Clydesdale, Equalizer, King Crunch, Bigfoot, Carolina Crusher, and Nightlife. Trucks in here that haven't won a gosh dang race all night long are somehow in the final nine just because they're consistently going to the line and trying to make a pass. I was going to say, this is probably about the last nine trucks that are running on the property. Yeah, probably. <laughs> that's that's what I took it as. First semifinal matchup, Master Disaster, USA 1, and Tough Enough. This bracket is so hard to follow at this point, it's not even funny. Tough Enough should not should have been on the trailer after round one, but has been brought back twice now. The whole shot, though, goes to Master Disaster. The truck's bouncing like it has all, all stinking night, but somehow, miraculously, USA 1 has the same issue. MOD and USA 1 go to the line together, but by about a half a wheel, Doug Spanier pulls out a kind of a miracle win right here to go back to the final in Texas. It's cool. He has a chance to repeat. Cinderella's back at the ball, really. Oh, yeah. You got to figure out which Ruby Slippery grabbed. Wait, that's yeah. uh, Wizard of Oz. Never mind. <laughs> King Crunch, Clydesdale, Equalizer. Equalizer takes the win here after both guys go over, excuse me, Equalizer takes the win, both of these guys, by a truck length. Uh, top end speed here for Equalizer is, is ridiculous. They leave the line, almost all of them together, and then by the end of the track, Equalizer's got a truck length lead on them just from the speed it has through no man's land. It really looks like Equalizer's race to lose at this point. It, I mean, night two... This is Equalizer's night. I mean, you, that truck is just, it's running great. They, they have it running great. It's got the speeds. And um, it just seems like a cut above. This is where it really feels like it's not the same kind of truck. Night one was different, but with night two here, you're really seeing, I think it's its really also the um, that war of attrition where Equalizer's got the suspension that can handle this kind of a track. Yeah. These other like, trucks, like you said, these ramps are now uh, a, a tighter packed ramp than they were the day before. It's going to lend to him because usually on the bigger air tracks, you would see equalizer still flying low and straight. Yep, and that's yep. what really it, helps him here in this race. It's an advantage. The truck has a big advantage too, and I think it's also the truck is not as beat up as the other ones are getting too with the, yeah. the normal leaf spring, the traditional leaf spring suspension. Last semifinal here, Bigfoot, Carolina Crusher, and Nightlife. Again, Bigfoot back to the line by manpower. Bigfoot needs a miracle right here and unfortunately doesn't get it. Carolina Crusher has a smooth pass on the far side, but the surprise here, Nightlife, one of the most consistent trucks that we were talking about, ends up defeating Carolina Crusher right here to go to the final round. I know. Again, Dave Weissork, man, he's on it and super bit of smooth. A surprise. And it was a bit of a surprise to see that he would go to the final here. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you looked at these three, if you were a betting person, that is the heavy, heavy underdog with the two oh, trucks yeah. that are here. Well, if you're if you're betting on it that night, you're probably betting against Bigfoot because you've seen the breakage. Yeah, you know that it's it's going out. But still, look, I mean, you would think Gary Porter, though. Yeah, a, Porter probably wasn't on kill like he was like he needed to be. And truth be told, I mean. I don't blame Gary for not being 100% on the throttle this entire race because of some of the stuff that he saw. He wanted to put his truck on the trailer and just get the heck out of there. Probably. And that's something important to, to talk about. You know, the, the way this event was, you had guys probably at this point strategically thinking, hey, I'm in it so far and I might not have to, you know, I'm again, I can go to the next show. <laughs> exactly. I can, I can load my easy. truck up and be at the next show before these guys get out of the parking lot the next day. Yeah, I know. Final round here, probably a, a final that you wouldn't have expected, again, for this uh, this bracket and the number of superstar trucks that we had here. Nightlife, Equalizer, and Master of Disaster. We got an all-Chevrolet final here. They make sure to say that. You have three stories in this final round, though. Number one, you have a truck that is a proven champion. And number two, you have one truck that is just here for points. Or, excuse me, isn't here for points. It's just here for the win. You have a brand new dog with an or a brand new truck with an uh, that is an underdog behind the wheel, which is Dave mm -hmm. Osorik. I mean, he's looking for his first TNT win as well. Other other two trucks have won in TNT. This truck is not. Yeah. Then it's, again, uh, we get that crappy music, the anticipation for the final. I hate the Monster Smash. Like awesome. everything in this is awesome until they get to that music and the Monster Smash final build up. Bull crap. Not something that I like. Sorry. Fight me in the comments if you want. <laughs> but anyway. Master Disaster yet again wheels up off the line. 
Uh, you can see Equalizer has a leg up on the leg up on these guys though. At the end, Equalizer gets hit. Greg Holbrook specifically gets his first TNT Circuit win, and he gets to take home the Texas Cup. I don't know how it was decided, but now, for some reason, he's the Texas now, Cup guy. Yeah, how does how does that work? Because Master Disaster won the final and then was back in the final. As Equalizer far as I know, really. and just by looking at this, I believe that the Texas Cup was actually that particular race. The winner of that race won the Texas Cup. Oh, the literal of that race. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was that, confused. Uh, to, me, to me, MOD finishes second here. Excuse me, finishes third. So it's a first and a third for him. He would, he'd be the logical guy that would take it home if it was based on a points for the entire weekend. Uh, Equalizer, though, wins this race, wins the Texas Cup. Yep. Full shot went to nightlife though, but that top end speed for equalizer. I don't know if they made a gear change from day one, but obviously they did something because that truck just hooked up and he gets quite the trophy for his effort. Yeah. The equalizer again, this tonight equalizer was just a cut above. I mean, yeah. it really, it really looked like it was his race. Even master disaster, which truck to have been running fast, man. Um, equalizer truck was just, it just looked like a, an advanced truck. Yeah, it just and the track played into it. Army congratulates the Equalizer team, and in really an Equalizer fashion, the interview's short and sweet. They just say thank you. Uh, basically, Greg says all I need is a little bit more seat time. And it's scary to think if he gets a little bit more seat time, how good he's going to be in that truck. Mm-hmm. I know, and that's it's funny. It's how early it is in his career, really. With and this, Greg wasn't around very long, to my knowledge. Shortly after, I want to say the 91 season, we get David Morris back behind the wheel of Equalizer. But, uh, boy, when Greg was there, he really made a statement as far as that what that truck can do. It didn't really matter who drove it. The truck was going to perform. Yeah, and it's funny that I do remember him, despite him not really having a long career, people remember him because of how well he did drive it when. Yeah, and he honestly, TNT in 1990, we've said it before on this podcast, is probably the best year of TNT racing because of all the stuff that was going on in TNT, you had all the drama surrounding Bigfoot 8, Bigfoot 4, Scott Stevens and King Crunch. You had, despite what many people say, Bigfoot, yes, dominates the series. But there are a lot of events here on TNT, TNT TV where you see different winners. There are guys you wouldn't necessarily think would win events that were winning events. Like Master Disaster, out of nowhere, shocks everybody, wins in the biggest field in TNT history. Just... Stuff that you can really remember from this this season. This is when TNT was at its height and, unfortunately, at its end. Yeah, so this is a good point to wrap it up here. And this event is so important to me because this might be my – I don't know. It's, it's one of my favorite monster truck events of all time. I'll just put it that way to watch. I think it's incredibly entertaining mm-hmm. to watch even 30-some years later. It's got drama. It's got – Rex, it's got great racing, it's got different people winning, uh, just stories galore. The production is fantastic. You've got yep. the you know great production, great the iconic play by play duo. You just have everything, and it also though it feels like again this is the height, and it comes down from here um, because it you can just see the rules and the competition and everything starting to eat itself. The you have kind of, the, I, I'd say the inmates running the asylum, but I don't really know if that's fair because, again, TNT is trying to do what they can, but you've got all these big philosophies now. You've got Everett Jasmer, who just wants to, the trucks to be what they are and run straight, you know, yeah. and you've got Equalizer, which is really a stage three truck, I think. I mean, it's it, it's close to it, very close to it, if it's not. Uh, and so you've got all these trucks differing ideas with rules you've got like the engine thing they're trying to put in uh there's just so much going on here that it it really can't sustain it i you know for for much longer yeah i agree with you uh one quick thing to note here at the end of this show because equalizer wins this event it actually takes over the points lead again which bigfoot had just claimed from them and now is lost 342 to 338 still very much in the fight though king crunch at 329 and then uh gary porter at 284, still in this as well. Awesome Collins kind of starting to fade out a little bit. USA 1 starting to come back into it a little bit as it passes Gravedigger to go from 7th to 6th in points. Mm-hmm. And that's really the only changes that you see here as far as in, in the points. Uh, my opinion after this, after this two-day event, we have a new, new point leader. The top five are still very much into this. 
the weekend events were such a handful for the TNT team. That whole couple of weeks right there had to be some of the most stressful times for officials, drivers, teams, fans of the sport. I mean, you're watching something that was just unprecedented. You're watching a truck that, in all fairness, stayed within the rules, was built within the rules, and then is completely outlawed just because it's too good. I can remember the only time I ever heard of a a vehicle like in, in a major motorsport being banned like that in the 90s. I'm sure it happened in Formula One and stuff like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking a major American motorsport, which is NASCAR. The Jeff Gordon 1990, what was it, 97, was it 97 or 98 uh, T-Rex car that they took to uh, the Winston and just flat killed everybody with. And NASCAR's like, yeah, don't bring that back again. Because they built it within every inch of the rules that they possibly could. Even though it was within the rules, NASCAR said they couldn't bring it back. Yeah, and you know, you you just talked about like this event, just kind of a, a nice little wrap up on it. This had to have been one of the most stressful for everybody because you just had so much going on. And let's talk about the venue. You know, you had this, they're in Cowboys, you know, Texas Stadium, man. This is a huge venue oh, for yeah. TNT. That TNT ran the Astrodome, but did they run any other really big places outside of that? Um, Let's think. They had it was this mainly place, the, they had the Astrodome, which USHRA had the Astrodome as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd them, have to go back and look at the schedule again just to be it's 100% mainly fairgrounds. Sure. Fairgrounds. And yeah, skateboarding. they were mainly fairgrounds and indoor style hockey arenas and stuff like that. Well, in the three wides, you have a new format. Yeah. I mean, this is three wide monster truck racing. So you have all of this stuff going on. And again, I think that soon, though, that if you look at this versus the USHRA, and again, to me, I like watching all old school monster trucks, but watching TNT versus USHRA is so different because yeah. TNT is just, you know, white knuckle racing and it's so entertaining where the USHRA is more, I guess, kind of the it's, thrill it's, show. It's like what we've talked about in previous episodes. USHRA is about the spectacle. It is. And again, I don't mean to knock it because I love that stuff and I love some of the vehicles that ran over there, but. That stuff, you really, I feel like, have to really love monster trucks to like it if you watch it these days. TNT, you could show this event, like, to anybody and be like, oh, man. Like, it's so exciting. And it's just... Yeah, I even put that in my notes here at the end of it. I said, if you show these events to a new fan who may have not ever seen these events before, they're going to be sucked straight into the drama that the ESPN crew creates right here. Yeah, again, I... Everything came together for this weekend of these races, and they're just... To me, this is the height of TNT, and yeah. unfortunately, the fall happens after, and you can actually probably see why TNT didn't last and got bought out by a more show-oriented company, because this was in the attempt to be the real racing series. You just have all this madness going on with rules and trucks not being allowed and, and all this other stuff to where it really, they didn't, it feels like they it didn't know where it really needed to go, I guess, and they're trying to figure stuff out. Yeah, um, and it's it's such a shame that it happens to TNT, and it's one of the biggest what ifs in the sports history. Is when people say, "What if TNT would have survived?" I guarantee, I you, if TNT would have survived, this sport would look a hell of a lot different than it does now. But anyway, uh, this this whole weekend had to be. I mean, as soon as they cross the finish line on that second show, Equalizer wins. I can imagine their officials up in the booth. They're just leaning back in their chairs like I'm doing right now. And letting out a giant deep breath of like, oh, we made it. Yeah, I I agree. They had to have been. It just it had everything. And I guess we can. We've been going on here for over two hours. If you oh want. yeah, we've been going on for a while here to rate it. I gotta say, this is the highest rating that I've given a show. Uh, if anybody's keeping track at home, I gave this a nine out of ten because of everything that we've talked about from the beginning to end here of how much drama, excitement, and stress. That we witnessed in this these two two or excuse me these two one hour broadcasts just of these shows it's astonishing that they got this product out there after everything that they had to go through. Yeah, and I guess for me, I was thinking on my rating here, and I have thought about it, but I think I have to give it the ten out of ten for me because um, this is I, I waffle between ten or nine, but just because you had maybe a couple little things like Bigfoot and the breakage, but given all the storylines and the drama. And just everything about this, I think I have to give this a 10 out of 10. It is 
something that I think this is my favorite old school event to probably watch because I get excited watching it now. Even it's just um, oh yeah, I got excited. I was getting excited too, and I can imagine just like uh, just like a few people after that Scott Stevens interview on day two, you're almost like, dude, what? Seriously, you you still think that thirty one years later after this has been broadcast? I know you still just kind of shake your head at like, why, dude? And even Andy Brass's statement in the first episode where he's like, well, they could have took a year off too. Andy, come on, man. No. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, yeah, his, I, I, I know we're at the end of it. His statement too was kind of focused like that. It's just wild. Again, this is just a, a special event and a special time. And it's a shame it didn't last longer than it did. But this is really, yeah. it, it feels in a way, this is like the, you know, the wrestling thing. This is the WrestleMania 17, I feel like. And after this, TNT changes. And it's not that it necessarily goes downhill because this, this season's a good season, but I just feel like everything right here was just so much fun. And I it's like the, the height of an the era. Change, the big change of everything, it wasn't necessarily on the product itself. You still saw some amazing racing after this, not knocking any event after this because they were some great, great outdoor racing after this, as well as some indoor racing that they had at the end of the season. What really happened, though, I think is behind the scenes that you're talking yeah. about yeah. more than it showed up on camera. Yes. Because behind the scenes, after this event, I think the stress level is the highest it's going to be here. But at the end of this event, I think everybody's just over it. We'll put it that way. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that this, and then you even had like a lawsuit eventually, like Bigfoot, I think, sued TNT. And so. Yeah, and that's it, the reason eight comes back later and they don't wait for these brand new trucks. If by the time they're waiting for these brand new trucks to come out, it's going to be mid 91. Yeah, I, I guess that's where. To me, I, I remember on the, the podcast you had with Jason when you were talking about Pontiac as the end of an era. To me, um, this feels more like the 90s are here now. Like this yeah. is the end. This is really the end. It's almost like this isn't the end of the 80s. This is the beginning of the 90s because uh, even though the technology is about to change significantly, this is even like, hey, the technology is banned right now. It's here and we're trying to hold on it's to this. It's here and we're trying to push it can. back. Yeah, and – this event shows why you cannot do that because just it was too hard on equipment, too hard on people. Luckily, there was nobody hurt. There could have been somebody seriously hurt, a driver or somebody on the ground here with the way these trucks are running. And it just feels like, again, this is the absolute peak end of the, the Leafer era with these trucks. They cannot handle anything more you could throw at them exactly. as far as, as this goes. And it shows you why the Tauruses and the Bigfoot 8s and all the trucks that are about the Carolina Crusher threes and all this stuff that's about to happen, why it has to happen. And so, yeah, 10 out of 10 to me, this was an amazing event to talk about. I'm so happy I got to talk about this one. Oh, yeah. I was glad, glad to have you here for it. We both did an extensive amount of research on this. We knew it was going to be a long show going into it. I, I love the conversation that we had. It perfectly encapsules this event. And, uh, man, I got to say, this has been the Retro Monster Truck Review. And, and, Doug, you know what? I'll see you again on the Tracks Across America, buddy. Thanks. Take care, everybody.